Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm Mark Roglan. I'm the Linda P. and William A. Custer, Director of the Meadows Museum and Centennial Chair in the Meadows School of the Arts, and we'd love to welcome you to what is going to be, um, what we hope is going to be a great day uh, with presentations on uh, of, uh, an artist that we all have very close in our minds and we think about all the time, which is Goya. And uh, we have this wonderful exhibition going on and will still be up through March 1st uh, that one of our fellows curated, Alexander Levin. I just wanted to say welcome. I just wanted to say uh, many thanks to, this is the first um, collaboration we have with the Edith Donnell Institute of Art History, which was um, just started just a few months ago. And the founding director of the Institute, as well as the Margaret McDermott Distinguished Chair in UTD Dallas, uh, Rick Brittell, spearheaded this incredible effort. Um, Rick was telling us yesterday night how, uh, you know, we have in North Texas, no, 100 plus, 160 plus PhDs in our history. So he's trying to bring all of us together uh, under this umbrella and uh, through the Institute. It's the first collaboration. We hope that's the first one of many more uh, to come. Also, uh, thanks to the Middles Foundation, no, because uh, they're so supportive and they co-sponsor the, the, the symposium and all these uh, lectures that have been taking place for the last couple of days. Uh, you, a number of us here uh, were here just discussing about Goya yesterday too in the galleries, and it was just amazing to see all the number of ideas and uh, sharing thoughts about this artist and, and how just, um, I suppose, the, the legend goes on when it comes to Goya and all the thinking is so deep. Um, when it comes to this great artist. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna invite Rick to say a few words and then we'll get the symposium started. Yeah. I just wanted to tell a little story about, in I think it was in 1986, I was at the Art Institute of Chicago and I was uh, going to New York as one does from the provinces. And uh, I was sitting next to this guy on the plane who had, was also going to New York because he lived there and he was teaching at the Iowa Writers Workshop. And he was telling me, I was saying, well, how do you get r writers to, you know, to, what do you do for exercises for writers? And he said, well, we use art. And I said, oh, how, how, do, what, how do you do that? And he said, well, you know, I choose a famous painting with lots of figures in it, and I put it on the screen, and I tell the students in the room to write a narrative that either ends in the painting or begins from it and to use the gestures and the costumes and the facial expressions and the positions and all of that as a way of, and I thought, wow, you know, why don't we do that in art history and, and how, how interesting. And, and it turned out that the man sitting next to me was James Lapine. And so, and he said, well, you know, I'm having dinner tomorrow night with my friend Stephen Sondheim. Would you like to come? <laughs> and so I said, sure. <laughs> And so the three of us had dinner, and I said, you know, this idea is so interesting to me. Has anyone ever thought about writing a musical about this? And, and we, the, I'm the curator of the Grand Jade, and it's down now because we're studying it and doing pigment analysis. And, and so Stephen Sondheim was just enchanted, and the two of them flew to Chicago two weeks later, and we spent a week with the painting and with all of the reproductions of all of the things, and out of it came the musical Sunday in the Park with George. And though you might not think that this has anything to do either with Goya or with um, the Institute, the Edith O'Donnell Institute, in fact it does. Because the wonderful song in the first act of that musical called Putting It Together, in which various figures observed at various different times in a setting are distilled and, and put into their arrangements and then meta arrangements are made and then finally this work of art comes into being. Um, is what you put together if you're an artist. And as I was coming, driving this morning here, I was thinking of, of that and what we really want to do with art history in, the, in North Texas. We do have 160 art historians who work for universities, colleges, museums, um, galleries, independently, whatever. And the idea of, of thinking about us as a group and, and putting together something that is more than the sum of the parts is really what the Edith O'Donnell Institute wants to do. And so it'll be, we'll do a whole series of collaborations, this being the first one with the Meadows, with lots of other institutions and lots of other scales. And we hope very much to put it together 
as well as Alexandra Letvin has put together today's symposium, and I let her introduce it. Thank you, Rick. Uh, well, hello and, and welcome to the International Symposium Curating Goya. I'd like to give a special welcome to the group of invited scholars who have joined us this weekend for conversations about Goya. Uh, Juliette Barrow, Xavier Bray from the Dulwich Picture Gallery in London, uh, Frederick Ilchman from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, Chio Ishikawa from the Seattle Art Museum, Andrew Schultz from Pen Pennsylvania State University, uh, Stephanie Stepanek from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Janice Tomlinson from the University Museums, University of Delaware, and Reva Wolf from the State University of New York at New Paltz. They arrived to Dallas on Thursday night, and we spent Friday upstairs in the galleries, as Mark said, engaged in many memorable and productive conversations about Goya. Um, I'd also like to thank both the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History and the Meadows Museum for so generously supporting the symposium and this wonderful opportunity for discussion. When Rick, Mark, and I began discussing ideas for a symposium topic on Goya, we started with the seemingly simple question, where do we go from here? Um, but then when it came down to it, we also had to ask, so where is here? In our description of the symposium topic, we quoted a recent news article in which the author wrote of Goya's pop culture moment. The author was referring to the large scale and incredibly ambitious exhibition devoted to Goya at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston that opened this September, um, to the exhibition at the Meadows, and to three upcoming exhibitions set to open in London and in Madrid. And we're fortunate to have representatives of many of these exhibitions uh, in our audience today. At the same time, we might ask, when is Goya not enjoying a pop culture moment? The article's author attributed Goya's status as pop culture phenomenon to his engagement with modern themes, his ability to lay bare anxiety, violence, sadism, lust, and ambivalence, as no artist before him had ever done. Indeed, Goya's images often speak so powerfully that it can feel as if they were made in our own time. But it may be more appropriate to classify Goya as a timeless artist rather than a modern one. It's certainly difficult to think of a time when his images wouldn't resonate as strongly as they do now. With over 1,800 works attributed to him, ranging from grand court portraits to miniature paintings on ivories, Goya provides a seemingly inexhaustible source for study and display. He was constantly inventing, experimenting, and pushing the limits of the representable. My own field of research is Spanish Golden Age painting, so it was as an outsider that I approached Goya when I began preparing the Meadows exhibit, Goya, A Lifetime of Graphic Invention. And over the course of six decades, Goya created almost 300 etchings and lithographs, 228 of which are in the Meadows Museum's collection. As I studied these prints, I quickly found myself immersed in the world of an artist whose sheer inventiveness overwhelmed me. In the works on view upstairs alone, we see the amazing range of subjects that captivated him, cavorting witches, biting and uncompromising social satires, penetrating condemnations of human cruelty, and dreamlike fantasies. It is precisely this vast and varied output that presents particular challenges for the interpretation and the display of Goya's art. Any exhibition dedicated to him must deal with certain basic questions, whether to show his art by medium, by theme, or by chronology, and whether to show him in the context of his contemporaries or in isolation. When I began thinking about how to exhibit his prints, which represent just a fraction of his production, it seemed imperative to find a way to do credit to the artist's complexity by letting his works speak for themselves and letting Goya's chameleon-like personality evade viewers in the same way that it continues to evade me. By inviting close looking and minimal commentary, I hope to remove the crutch of wall labels that we've all become accustomed to in museums and to facilitate a direct engagement with his images themselves. Rather than show all the series in their printed order, I tried to find a balance between acknowledging their seriality and breaking apart the series to examine specific themes that Goya explored. And by displaying Goya's prints in relation to the museum's paintings by Goya, I hope to elevate his prints to the same level as his paintings and to offer an alternative itinerary for considering the range of Goya's artistic production, one that centered not on paintings, but on the inherently public, yet intensely personal medium of printmaking. Many of the questions and issues that I just mentioned were tackled most recently by Stephanie Stepanek and Frederick Ilchman in their recent exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, 
which displayed around 160 works by Goya. Forgoing a traditional chronological or monographic approach, they displayed Goya's works according to themes in a beautiful installation that has already sparked many new paths of inquiry. And so without further comment, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Frederick Ilchman, who is the Chair of Art of Europe at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and then Mrs. Russell w. w. Baker, Curator of Paintings. A specialist in the art of the Italian Renaissance, he has curated numerous exhibitions, including the acclaimed Titian, Tintorento, Veronese, Rivals in Renaissance Venice, um, organized with the Musée du Louvre. Um, he is the co-curator, along with Stephanie Stepanik, of Goya, Order and Disorder, which was on view in Boston this fall. Um, and today he will speak to us about a reshuffled retrospective in Boston. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very, very much for having me. I served as a co-curator, as Alexandra said, of a major Goya exhibition that closed just a few weeks ago. Like the Meadows Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston takes Goya very seriously. We have a proud tradition of Goya collecting, research, and exhibitions. The MFA is one of the top collections of Goya's works on paper in the world, including about 20 drawings, uh, four bound volumes, that is four intact books of the first edition of the Caprichos, many of the disasters of war prints but in original early working proofs, and we have the famous aquatint of the seated giant you see on the screen there. Uh, it is one of only six impressions of this great print in the world, and it served as the logo, the kind of poster uh, and catalog cover for our recent exhibition. MFA also has a strong tradition of Goya exhibitions, and this is a favorite shot here. Um, this is uh, Goya in the Spirit of Enlightenment, uh, 1989. You see the older woman wearing a Goya t-shirt. That's Eleanor Sayre, famous Boston curator and Goya expert, and uh, she was incidentally the granddaughter of President Woodrow Wilson. And uh, there were very long lines to get into the 1989 exhibition, just like there were for our, our show just recently. And one thing that Eleanor Sayer would do, would go to the back of the line and find a little child who was distressed from the long wait. And she'd bring the child and the parent right up to the front of the line. <laughs> a, a child shouldn't have to wait to get a first crack at seeing Goya. And here you see uh, Stephanie there on the left. She's in the, in the front row. And then on the right, we're both in inspecting the Duchess of Alba by Goya in black. And Stephanie has been teaching me quite a lot, even teaching me how to do that famous pointing down gesture of the Duchess. Um, and Stephanie is really Eleanor's disciple at the MFA, and she's continued. Can we have it a little darker here, in fact? Would that be possible? Oh, thanks. Um, and she's been continuing uh, the tradition of proud Goya scholarship at the MFA and then sharing her vast knowledge uh, with me and others on the staff. Thus we have at the MFA not just a strong Goya collection, which could be the base of an exhibition, but the credibility uh, to mount a major exhibition of the artist. Yet I admit I am a relative newcomer uh, to Goya. And by contrast, this room here is full of uh, Goya scholars or renowned specialists in Spanish art. One was my curator, Stephanie Stepanek, uh, co-curator. Others here include the distinguished Goya uh, experts, uh, Julia wilson Barrow and Janice Tomlinson. Uh, and they were part of the cura curatorial team for the Goya Order and Disorder exhibition, helped with the planning of the show, and made major contributions to the catalog. Others, such as Mark Roglan, our fearless leader here at the Meadows, um, and uh, Javier Bray, who was the next speaker this morning, and Bill Jordan, who had his legendary career at the Meadows and the Kimball. They advised us throughout the planning of the exhibition, keeping us surprised with their own work and ideas, and still others, including Alexander Letwin, who um, int introduced uh, the symposium, and Edward Payne, are scholars of a new generation, and I met them during the run of the show in Boston. They were some of the more than 203,000 visitors whom we welcomed uh, to that show. So it's a pleasure to see uh, everyone here gather today and acknowledge their help and encouragement. But also I'd like to recognize the extraordinary loans of works of art, uh, paintings, prints, and drawings that came to Boston, enabling a great exhibition. And these included such important works as ones from the Meadows Museum. You lent two, for which we're deeply grateful. Uh, the marvelously subtle um, uh, Still Life of uh, Woodcox, very, very poignant. And then, of course, uh, the more uh, famous and important, the haunting, powerful evocation of an insane asylum, the yard with madmen, uh, with the unworldly, uh, coming, uh, unworldly light coming from above. 
Now, unlike uh, Stephanie, my background is in Italian Renaissance uh, studies and uh, Renaissance painting, specifically the art of Renaissance Venice, and my own field is Tintoretto, particularly. Oops, oops, oh, shoot. I just turned that off. Sorry, Scott. I was trying to look for the uh, clicker. There we go. Um, I will just point. On the, the right side, you see uh, Tintoretto's early self-portrait from around 1548 at the Philadelphia Museum, and then on the left, uh, one of his great last suppers with this, um, about 1560 or so, this amazing heaving uh, motion of the apostles, uh, lean in and lean back as they receive the news that one of them uh, will betray Christ. So that's really my field, um, and uh, my own work, uh, my approach really to creating exhibitions has been deeply influenced by working on several large shows of Venetian 16th century painting, and helping uh, curate two shows in particular, one in Boston and Paris, and then one before that actually at the Prado, uh, really helped me formulate my own principles of effective museum installations and the importance of selection, editing, contrast, pacing, and narrative within an exhibition. So now the first exhibition of these large ones that I worked on uh, was in 2007, the Museo del Prado's exhibition, uh, 2007, I was part of the curatorial team. This was the first Tintoretto retrospective uh, since 1937. That previous one uh, was held at Capesaro in Venice under the patronage of Mussolini, so it had been quite a while uh, since a major Tintoretto show had happened. And the Prada proved you could actually do a Tintoretto show, that even though he has enormous paintings, most of them larger than the screen, you could pull something together. There on the left, in fact, you see that Philadelphia self-portrait greeting you at the beginning, and then they use that long main hall of the Prada, you know, the one which used to have Robert and big Spanish Golden Age, now has uh, sort of Titian and Venetian on one end, and now Rubens on the other. So this was a spectacular uh, exhibition, and like many retrospectives, it was organized chronologically, earliest at the beginning, latest at the end, and they painted the walls of that famous central quarter a beautiful blue uh, to make clear that this is the special exhibition, even though it's been inserted in the space normally reserved for the uh, permanent collection, and then you see it unfolding there, very large format paintings, and in fact, uh, between the pairs of columns there's a doorway. You look down there, you see head-on Velázquez's Las Meninas, and it a, was a wonderful juxtaposition, a little bonus uh, in the show. Um, now, in an exhibition, you typically uh, organize them chronologically, so you can see when an artist's style and concerns unfold over the course of their career, and a chronological exhibition is very useful to scholars in trying to figure out precise uh, datings of works of art, right? If you have a number of works that purportedly are together and like, no, nah, that just doesn't work. It's got to be earlier. Or look at that. This one looks a lot more like that painting than it ever occurred to us. Maybe they were done around the same time. So for concerns of chronology, uh, a chronologically exhibition, arranged exhibition is incredibly useful. Um, and of course, when you do something chronologically, you start with your first room with the early works, not so impressive often. Uh, then you see the highs and lows as the fledgling artist tries to find a signature style. Uh, then you hope to have the real pride of the maturity when they sort of, uh, he or she hits uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a certain, certain level of quality, consistency, and a coherent vision. And then you better hope that your artist has a really great late period, because that's the subject of the last room. <laughs> And, uh, and so that's you know, one of the challenges of the retrospective, because indeed, if it follows the arc of an artist's career, well, it has to follow, uh, to some extent, those ups and downs. Um, and uh, now the Prada, one long big corridor, with a couple rooms off to the side, but as one space, it wasn't divided into rooms. So it was a little hard to figure out what are the chapters? How would you begin these various stages? Are there ways you could mark boundaries in an artist's career? And so being part of this team resolved to me, to me in my case, saying, if you're trying to sum up an artist, you know, it's nice to have room so you can have divisions and you can uh, have one chapter end and another one begin. Um, uh, but another crucial thing I learned, of course, is that uh, you have to be representative. Now, representative doesn't mean being as average as the artist is, right? Someone churns out a whole bunch of minor portraits like Tintoretto does. You want to pick the best ones. You don't want to be, you want to, you want to make him look good, right? Rather than being as, let's say, accurate as possible. You want to pick uh, the best works. And many of Tintoretto's works are just too big to transport. So we had to show him at his mid and uh, size. Could not show him at his absolute biggest. For that, you need to go to Venice. You need to go to the Scuola Grande San Rocco or the Plaza Ducale or certain churches, the Madonna de Lorto, et cetera, to see giant, giant works of art. 
And many of these works, you know, they're just so big, you'd have to roll, they're bigger than the doorways for their buildings, you'd have to roll them up to get them out of the building. And most curators wouldn't want to do that. Uh, though I would say under, under, under Mussolini, that, uh, that did happen frequently. Um, now, other works are just simply immovable, right? We're talking about tombs made by sculptors or frescoes. And any of you who have been to Madrid know that one of the great pleasures is to see the uh, Hermitage Church of San Antonio de la Florida done in 1798. And it's marvelous. These are Goya frescoes up in the apse, the pendentives, and uh, the cupola. Uh, these are wonderful, wonderful works. Um, but of course, you can't take apart that building. And so uh, a nice little touch in the Boston exhibition is we had two of these oil sketches preparatory for these uh, frescoes. And indeed, the semicircular uh, half moon uh, format was very typical. If you're going to be painting a curved surface like a dome, this is how you would indicate uh, that would be. This shows the miracle of St. Anthony of Padua bringing a man back to life. And then this shows what goes, that was in the cupola. This is in the apse, uh, the glory of the Trinity there with the actual sculpture in, finally, in the, in the completed work of art taking the place of that triangle uh, with the, uh, the light emitted from it. But artist makes lots and lots of mediocre works. Well, it doesn't really do uh, much service uh, to include any of those. You want to be as, uh, do as many favors to the artist as possible by being selective. Search for the best or the near best of an artist. And, um, you know, for example, uh, take work like this, the famous Manuel Osorio, probably the late 1780s, this uh, little boy son of one of the founders of the Bank of Spain. It's such a famous picture that people see this and say, oh, wow, that's a Goya. They know it, though, as a kind of uh, wonderful monument of the of, of art of childhood. This little boy, so innocent, for example, stares out the big bulging eyes of a doll, perhaps, or even a teddy bear. It doesn't really realize he's so innocent uh, that the cats there, actually there are three, it's easy to see in the original heart in a reproduction, three cats eyeing hungrily that little magpie on a string. He doesn't even realize uh, the sort of uh, the fatality, the, the, the consequences uh, of that. But a charming painting and uh, really showing Goya at his best. So that's the kind of level a good ex real exhibition should try to be heading for in their borrowing. Um, and so while finding uh, any old Go Goya portrait is relatively easy, finding a great one uh, can make a real difference. And, uh, and this is a key point, because what a curator does, uh, I think, is not just tracking down things, but being selective. That is, often what you leave out is as important as what you bring in. Um, now, exhibitions, I say this because exhibitions have to face certain limitations. One is limited wall space. You can only pack things too closely together. You can only have a certain number of rooms. Also, limited funds can easily cost $30,000 to bring a painting from Europe to the United States. So you really want to be sure this is something that you want. It's got to make sure it's going to add something to the exhibition. And one of the consequences, you often have to travel in person to see it to make sure it doesn't just fit into your argument, but it's a high enough level of quality. You can rely on friends, call them up, send an email. But you really should check for yourself to make sure it co co uh, conforms to your overall vision. Because it hasn't happened to me yet, but I could just imagine how unhappy it would be to open the crate of a painting and go, ooh, what a dog. Why didn't I just check it out first, right? Um, and then also, we have to remember the limited stamina of the visitor, right? Uh, a person can only take in so many works of art. And there is the reason the term museum fatigue exists, right? Uh, a great experience for me was a wonderful Matisse exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1994. Spectacular. I remember learning so much as someone devoted to the painting of the 16th century, learning so much about the drawing, sculpture, and graphic arts of one of the giants of the 20th century. And after about nine rooms of the show, I thought, this was just spectacular. And then I turned the corner and realized there another four or five rooms, <laughs> and my heart sunk. <laughs> All told, I think there were about 320 works. Enormous. Even Matisse's mother wouldn't want to see that many works. <laughs> so key to an exhibition, I believe, is being selective, striving for the best, arranging the works carefully, with enough space to let them breathe, but also close enough to bring out relationships, uh, pairs, groups of two, three, four. And I think a wonderful thing about the exhibition upstairs of Goya is that you've got these big series, but very subtly arranged into groups of two and three and four and six, sometimes double hung, sometimes on a single line, uh, that uh, really show fascinating relationships you might not consider if you're just leafing, leafing through the pages of a book, for example. Um, 
Now, the Prado's exhibition, this is back to the 2007 exhibition at the Prado, had a wonderful sense of pacing. You could see the artist Tintoretto growing in confidence, reaching for new, uh, reaching for new concepts, getting better and better in painting human anatomy, more subtle use of color, greater energy. Even as he uh, got older, he seemed to rise and rise with that. But as one long quarter, uh, which made very clear the chronological progression, you know, early period, middle period, late period, uh, it was hard to think about the chapters in Tintoretto's life. And so that's when I uh, made clear to me that if you can build walls, if you can move walls around, uh, then you can create rooms and uh, you can then make much more clear chapters of an artist's or, or, or a theme within a broader exhibition. So this is, uh, two years later, this is my exhibition, Titian Tintoretto Veronese, Rivals in Renaissance Venice. Uh, started in Boston, then went to the Louvre. Um, we, in fact, I was shopping around for quite some time trying to find another museum to take this exhibition, because in some cases you can save a lot of money if you have a partner, right? You can divide lots of costs, you can use two museums, clout to borrow uh, more works of art. Um, in this case, most American museums are either booked up, they said, great, we'll do it, but can we do it in 2010? I said, no, it's got to be 2009. Uh, and other places found it just a bit too expensive. Finally, uh, my then boss, George Shackelford, who's now uh, deputy director here at the Kimball, uh, he went to the Louvre to, on my behalf to ask to borrow a Tintoretto painting and a Titian. And they said, well, of course we'll lend them to you, but how about the Louvre being your second partner? And so we were of joy. So we joined with the Louvre. So in a sense, we married up. Um, and uh, that turned out very well, because we had so much help from French institutions. And we went back to the same people, uh, museums in Italy, and churches that I had approached, but for, with a higher level of ask. We felt that Boston Louvre together could have uh, a little more clout. Now, my exhibition, Titian Tintoretto Veronese, Rivals in Renaissance Venice, was the first time in a museum exhibition to look at the big three, Titian Tintoretto Veronese, in terms of their artistic competition, how they goaded each other on, and I arranged it thematically to see them all doing St. Jerome's or suppers at Emmaus or portraits of guys in fur coats, to see uh, not just how each one did their own speciality, but how they might have tried to uh, outdo the others or learn from the others and you know, take an idea and then respond to it. I think it worked pretty well. Now, an important thing about this, though, uh, was the way I planned this installation with uh, deep wall colors, a uh, large variety of illumination. Um, and indeed, this was the first room. In fact, the painting on the left was, the, was the, uh, on the sight line when you came down the corridor to enter the exhibition. Now, this room makes it look, this photo, makes it look much brighter than it was. Um, it was a beautiful, deep, sort of brick red color, with a little bit of maroon in it. And I've always been curious that the synonym in the English language for exhibition is show. Now, exhibition sounds didactic, a little dully edifying, like a trade show, you know, an exhibition of agricultural implements, plastic molding devices or something. But show? Who doesn't like a show, right? Everyone likes a show. And so I like the first room of an exhibition to be a bit like that moment when the lights go down at the start of a play or a Broadway musical or an opera, right? You kind of gather yourself, lights are going down, something important is about to happen. It's the sense of hushed expectation. You're getting out of the rest of the world and now entering the world of the exhibition. And I think a darkened or dramatically lit first room can really make that happen. So this is our uh, first room of that uh, show. And another important thing I've learned is remarkable how framing, that is actually literally picture framing, and placement of a work, how much a difference that can make. Um, this is a wonderful painting uh, by Tintoretto, early Tintoretto. He's still only semi-competent. Um, and it's the contest of Apollo and Marsyas. There's Apollo there on the left. And it's a curious shape, right? It's kind of oval, a bit like this room. In Renaissance Italy, generally, rectangular paintings went on walls, circular, elliptical, uh, octagonal went on ceilings. And this is a ceiling painting. But for decades, it's been shown at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford on the wall. And we even showed it in the Prado on the wall. And you can see it right there uh, on the left. Not particularly satisfying, though, because you can see the corners. The frame it takes no account of the corners. And indeed, those should be covered, right? It's like the, your shirt tail hanging out of your, 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 um, your suit there. And this whole thing should be uh, 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 elliptical or, or oval-shaped frame. So this is the Prado show in 2007, and deciding that really wasn't satisfying, I think, and not what Tintoretto intended, I uh, asked the curator conservators in the Hartford Museum, the Wadsworth Athenaeum, one, would they let us reframe it, and two, what about putting it back on the ceiling, where it originally uh, had gone? And so our frame, uh, he made a kind of little trompe l'oeil um, spandrel to cover uh, the corners there. 
and then you see it in our uh, painting storage room on a, on a uh, transport truck, and you see even by putting that little covering the edges, that kind of slip there, it completely reinforces the curves of the composition. It really makes this painting come to life. Um, and then you see here a newspaper article where we're putting it back on the ceiling in preparation for the exhibition. There you see it on the ceiling, and we set it into a whole Venetian-style ceiling with extremely, it's, I mean, it was imitation, but extremely uh, evocative uh, moldings, just like you would have had uh, in a church or um, a fancy home in Venice. First time it had been back on the ceiling, I think, in about 300 years. Um, so, so this was quite an ex ex exciting thing uh, to do this, and it, it's sometimes in an exhibition gathering things, but also how you present them. Uh, I also sometimes try to do some witty touches, or what I think are witty. This was the room of uh, mythological nude paintings. So these are love, these are Danais and Venuses um, by, uh, by Titian Tintoretto and Veronese. They almost all have in their upper corner a curtain, and there's, so I thought, let's put a little curtain as we go into the room, and it makes it a little voyeuristic, right? Peeking behind the curtain. So very, very handy that way. Um, and again, the room is much brighter in this photograph than it was there. I wanted it to be like candlelight because we all look better with candlelight, right? And also I kind of lowered the height a little bit of the pictures um, and picked a color, right? Bordello red, I thought pretty appropriate. Um, and uh, so this was spectacular. With, you've got three Titians there and then a Veronese in that row from left to right, just spectacular. And then you can play that up though. If you have this warm, sensuous space, you can get a little shock or frisson when you look through the doorway and see the very chaste portrait of a you know, young 10-year-old boy through there in the portraits room. And you'll notice how different the levels of lighting are. And that's an important thing, I believe, that you know, if everything is one big theme, keep it all together. But if you want to stress the boundaries for one theme or chapter, from mythological nudes, that's Titian on the left, and Veronese's response to Titian on the right, um, if you want to stress the divisions, Strong differences in wall color and strong differences in lighting can really make clear, aha, we're leaving one chapter and going to the next. And it really made it clear, of course, by having a red curtain just like you have uh, in those paintings. Now, um, this is the portrait room itself from uh, Titian Tintoretto Veronese. Much brighter, lighter wall colors uh, and uh, very different uh, in effect. Um, in fact, the skylights were even open there, so you could have a, it's a little bit of daylight as well. But that was striking to me because I realized then, I thought, that gathering into one room makes a real impact. Um, you get these fabulous faces who look across the centuries right at you. Um, and uh, who are these people? Uh, you know, you wonder as you look at them. And even if we know their names, and we certainly do with almost all Goya portraits, but not a lot from this period, we wonder what they're thinking as these portrait sitters look out at us. Um, and so these are some of the things I learned from the process of doing the Titian Tintoretto Veronese show. Now there are only 56 works in that exhibition, all paintings. Goya Orden Disorder is much bigger, 170 works. Um, but that's, uh, as Alexander said, this would be 170 is only a fraction of the more than 1,800 works in Goya's over, overall, prints, drawings, paintings, miniatures, etc. And one of the goals in this exhibition was to show all of Goya. Now, you can't move the Church of San Antonio de la Florida, but uh, to show almost all aspects of this work, uh, of his work. And it's tricky, though, because when you're looking at things like tapestries, miniatures on ivory, oil paintings, they're wildly different scales and sensitivity to light. Oil paintings can take a lot of light. Tapestries, not so much. Drawings, very, very little. And so that's another kind of question. And indeed, doing the Boston exhibition as a single venue show. We had no partner. It didn't go anywhere. We took it down three weeks ago, and that was that. Um, that really helped with obtaining loans of drawings. And we particularly wanted a very good group of drawings. We have about 40 drawings from his private albums, the biggest number assembled in some time. Now, Stephanie Stepanek, my co-curator, uh, sh she started working on a Goya retrospective about 10 years ago. And I joined her in the fall of 2009, right after my Titian Tintoretto Veronese uh, show was finished. So I spent five years working alongside her, learning from her. It was a delightful experience. And she was the Goya specialist, of course, but also the works on paper person. And I was the paintings person with lots of recent experience on loan negotiations to borrow major paintings. But from the start, Stephanie had de uh, devised a new approach to a Goya retrospective, a new way of looking at this much-studied artist. She wanted not a chronological installation, but a thematic one, grouping works, paintings, prints, drawings, etc., by similar subject matter 
or composition, and thus trying to draw out the connections in Goya's oeuvre across decades, early and late works near each other or next to each other, works in different media next to each other, and thus conveying the coherence of Goya's artistic vision. She also wanted to give equal weight to paintings, prints, and drawings. Not just because the show began first as a print and drawing show of Goya, and then later paintings were added and I joined the team, but Stephanie wanted to make clear that you can best understand Goya by seeing all his chosen media together. And this is not, the idea was not to have the case where you have a main exhibition, an exhibition is mostly paintings, and there's a kind of sad little works on paper ghetto or Siberia off to the side. No, no. That make clear the interconnections of this work, because it's absolutely essential. It's how Goya thought. He worked back and forth often in the same year and probably even, you know, month or day, uh, these various media. Now, I should also say that uh, Stephanie's original title was Hand in Mind, thinking a lot about creativity as a concept, working, thinking about Goya's working process. But we have at the MFA a title team made up of, the title team decides titles, and it's made up of uh, the head of education, head of PR, head of publications, a number of curators. And they said, well, Goya, Hand in Mind. Well, but all artists have a working process. They all take an idea and then executed, what's more specific to Goya? And so the team came up with order and disorder. Now at first we thought, oh dear, disorder, mental disorder, no it's not, you know, Goya's not crazy, but, but then we've later come to live with this title because it actually seems to be pretty effective. First, it certainly brought people in, but second, these are the two poles of his life. He, part of his life was relatively calm and prosperous Spain. Another part was, uh, uh, you know, under the Napoleonic invasion, the challenged institutions, uh, famine, uh, fighting war. So order and disorder were the poles he understood. But the other thing was that, you know, Goya, like all of us, lives in a disordered world. But a, an artist, like a scientist, might try to impose order on this disordered world. And the systematic way he makes prints, which you see upstairs, or his drawings an album, or the way he characterizes sitters of his oil paintings, the portraits, uh, is someone who's trying to be systematic about, about looking at the world. And so um, we, this, in the end, didn't change very much the checklist, the works in the show, but it very much changed how we presented it. Our introductions, part of the catalog, the wall text, the labels, etc. Now another concern we had was other exhibitions on Goya that were in process. We didn't want to duplicate efforts. We didn't want to make too many of the same points, right? Why bother doing the same thing that someone else is doing? And we didn't want to get in the way of other Goya uh, <laughs> exhibitions who were trying to borrow um, some of the same works, at least as much as possible. And we were particularly uh, attentive to a major exhibition planned on Goya's portraits by the National Gallery in London, scheduled for the autumn of 2015. And Javier Bray will speak about that ex upcoming show right after me. And Steph and I even traveled to London to exchange information in order to minimize the overlap. And our plan was to show portraits as only one aspect of a much wider look at Goya uh, and concentrate on works obtainable in the United States and supplement them with some loans um, from Europe because the ones in the United States, of course, are easier to borrow and easier to transport. But a complication. Our Boya, Boston Goya exhibition was originally intended to be in the spring of 2012, more than three years before the London Goya show. So a comfortable gap. Unfortunately, for reasons completely beyond Stephanie or my control, our administration decided to move the Goya exhibition later in the schedule to the autumn of 2014, just one year before the London plan. And this was partially for financial reasons, because a big show like this costs a lot of money with lots of loans, but also because we opened, and re opened a renovated wing of contemporary art, uh, and we wanted uh, to have an exhibition by a living artist uh, in the spring of 2012. Now, I think Goya is completely irrelevant to the present day, but he did die in 1828. So instead of the spring of 2012, we had Alex Katz Prince. So, uh, so Stephanie and I were horrified by this sudden change, and we immediately wrote to Javier Bray uh, in London to apologize and uh, repeat our goal of minimizing the overlap and so we, we sort of affirm some of the things we plan to do. Uh, this very charming kid, Francisco de Paula, is um, it's an oil sketch for a big group portrait in 1800. Uh, this is the only portrait of a royal uh, person in our, um, or you know, king or prince, let's say immediate royal family in the exhibition. We, have, we didn't try to borrow any ones of uh, the king or queen. And remember, Goya was first court painter. Uh, the other thing, the goal of this was to show Goya's working methods, really, within our portrait section. Um, we have no late portraits, uh, so nothing from the Bordeaux period. We didn't uh, try to borrow major monuments of uh, his early work, like the Count of Florida Blanca, right there. 
And we also decided not to really concentrate on U.S. institutions and not uh, approach regional or provincial collections in France or Spain, places like Bilbao, Pamplona, Zaragoza, Santander, Valencia, Bayonne, etc. Lots of great Goya portraits are unusually spread out in many, many museums. Um, so we decided to use the core of portraits in the U.S. and supplement them with some key loans uh, from Europe. Now, one of them was this enormous painting, The Family of Don Luis, the man playing cards there in profile, youngest brother of Charles III. Um, and it's the picture of his family uh, and indeed his household, that is the entourage, the servants. It's a marvelous group portrait and really gets Goya going uh, as a portraitist. And this is owned by the Fondazione Magnani Rocca, which is a small country house museum outside of Parma in uh, central Italy in Emilia. And rather charmingly, the chairman of the board is an executive at the Barilla Pasta Company. Um, and so I went to meet with him and explained, and they said, well, we need significant help for doing a major exhibition. Major for them is medium-sized. And they wanted to do a Toulouse, Lautrec, and the Belle Epoque exhibition. And so we lent them 20 works, two paintings, nine Toulouse, Lautrec prints, including this one, and nine Japanese prints. We have almost an infinite number of Japanese prints in the Boston Museum of the kind that would have inspired the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists. So that was an example of, of really helping them, giving them the core of an exhibition uh, to allow a huge painting to come to us. Other things much, much more difficult, this famous painting, Time or the Old Women, comes from the museum in Lille, which is in northern France near the Belgian border. They turned us down twice. And then, amazingly, it fell into our lap. The same museum in Lille, with the help of the Louvre, was putting on an exhibition of a certain pharaoh of Middle Kingdom Egypt, and they needed our help. Again, we are an encyclopedic museum, strong depth there, uh, and so we were able to lend 12 of our pieces and in turn get that great painting um, from Lille. So here's the first room of the exhibition, all self-portraits, Goya looking at himself. Um, and we've got some nice connections. Uh, hard to see in the big group portrait, but there's a little girl at the, at the far left. You see her through the doorway, right, in the section on the life cycle. Again, we have a dark first room for that sense of expectation. And keep in mind this chocolate brown color, because we return to that in the last room. And something I think it's very important in a thematic show, which doesn't have the narrative arc of youth and uh, middle age, old age, death, uh, you, it's important to have a sort of sense where you think you've come around full circle and learned quite a lot in the process. So first room, self-portraits. Second room, uh, we had this famous portrait up, uh, and then old age. But in this one, we use the kind of heavy artillery. Great portraits from the Met on the left, Washington on the right, but in the context of prints and drawing illustrating childhood. Now, the next room was about games, pray and play and pray, pray, P-R-E-Y, because remember, every game has a winner and a loser, um, and certain games, like uh, bullfighting, well, one of the, one of the two really loses, um, and we brought together this wonderful example of a, of a game, carnival game of girls tossing a straw mannequin in a blanket, right? And so girls are not only having fun at boys' expense, but these are Spanish girls, and what's being tossed, the mannequin, the doll there, is a French dandy, so it's a nice Spanish-French uh, uh, competition. The far left is the uh, oil sketch, then the cartoon, which is the full-scale painting, which was then transformed into a tapestry. And to bring those two together was exciting. We've got the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles on the left, the cartoon from the Prado, and then the Royal Palace of Madrid on the right for the tapestry. That's one thing exhibitions do. They bring them together. But what we did differently, and Stephanie's idea of making, showing compositions or similar subjects across the course of Goya's career, meant that we had next to that group of three this print from the Disparate series. You'll see um, Disparate is also upstairs. And this is clearly the same composition, right? Women tossing something in a blanket. But look, they've now added more women. The format no longer vertical but horizontal, making it seem all the heavier. And inside, yes, there are some figures floating, but there is a, a corpse, maybe, or some face figure looking down, and then a big donkey right in the front of this blanket. So it appears it's become an impossible task. Sure, it's the same composition, but all the fun has gone out of the game. Now, this was done 20 years after the other ones, uh, 25 years. And if you place this two rooms later, you would not understand the connection. And the coherence of Goya's vision was something we wanted to emphasize. 
Uh, another uh, one of the best rooms is one on balance or imbalance, the whole room about equilibrium. And this is one of the great images. You can see it also in the exhibition of the Tauromachia, the art of bullfighting. This is the famous matador, Apignani, who would pole vault over an oncoming bull. And you can see, you know what's going to happen, right? In just a second, the pole's going to be knocked down, it'll clatter to the ground. We hope that Apignani has not broken his ankle. The bull's going to be coming around for another pass. Dust and noise, hoofs everywhere. But for this one split second, everything is in perfect equilibrium. It even looks like the matador's knee is resting on that horizontal line that marks the division of the floor and the beginning of the stands of the bull ring. An amazing, amazing image, but it's small scale. It's a print, not a painting, but we wanted to give it a lot of attention so it got its own wall on the axis when you looked from the room of bullfighting and games, etc., looked through into the room on balance. So we made the connection, bullfighting in both rooms, but one about games, one about balance. We gave it a fancier frame, a gold frame, thicker, than a normal frame you'd use for a print, the kind of frame you'd mostly use for a painting. Gave it its own wall, and then I had the electrician turn down the lighting of everything else in the room 10% to make this the brightest, right? And so that was a way of uh, emphasizing that. Also in this imbalance room is a pair of drawings. Ice skaters on the left uh, and a roller skater. It's a newfangled, brand new invention on the right. Stephanie's thinking of the exhibition again with this pair both in the Boston Museum. That's when she began to realize that a thematic approach could do a lot for Goya. But if you display these chronologically, they'd be a room apart. And you wouldn't realize that maybe balance and people on the edge of falling over were a central concern of Goya's. Move from the balance room, uh, you see then uh, into there's the Duchess of Alba pointing down in the portrait room. This was the grand portrait room. And although we had portraits in four different rooms, we wanted to have one place where we emphasized his achievement as a portraitist. Remember, that was his bread and butter. That's what he was known for. In our day, we know Goya for the creepy uh, witchcraft paintings, the things like the Assane Asylum here, uh, the Prince of the Disasters of War. But in Goya's day, he was famous as a portrait painter. He was the number one society portrait painter uh, in Madrid for about 20 years. And that, you can emphasize that point if you have a, a gathering of, his, of some of his greatest portraits. And so we brought that together, even though we had sp sprinkled portraits in a few other places. Um, and after all the close looking of lots of smaller prints and drawings, the experience then of going to a big room, largest by far, brightest by far, uh, the works most spread out, and also the only one with, with some architectural detailing, crown molding up above, base molding down below. Looked a little fancier, brighter, you sort of stood back and could have a different kind of looking. Here I am admiring the Duchess of Alba, and then here, uh, famous, you know, the famous inscription in the sand, Solo Goya, the idea that only Goya got to paint her, and the implication that only Goya could have pulled off a likeness this impressive. Again, what I'd done in the previous exhibition, you see another kind of shock, um, the portrait of Guimard, now here at the Meadows on loan in that nice conversation with Lopez. Um, but you look through all these, the doorway, you've got fancy dressed people on both sides, you look through the doorway to the almost naked St. John the Baptist. So I like that kind of contrast. And a thematic approach just brings out how fascinating Goy is. Is the person responsible for everything in the portrait room? The same guy, right, that did everything in this other room, other worlds, other states, that one portrait there of a, of a priest, but then a lot of condemnation of the church. And then uh, the really creepy Goya here, that's your, the Meadows picture on the left, pictures of madness, witches, right, the witches' Sabbath. And then you look through to the next room, and you see the famous disasters of war. These are all working proofs. Something else we did in this room of history and war was make the juxtaposition of famous still life from the same time and set as your painting of Woodcocks. This comes from the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, but juxtapose it with a print of similarly uh, sort of tossed down bodies, corpses uh, from the, the Napoleonic invasion. Now, this point has been made in the literature, but it's never been shown on the same museum wall because the still lifes are always shown with the still lifes, and the disasters of war prints are shown with the disasters of war. But they're done at the same time, and it's hard to believe that Goya wasn't thinking of them uh, as analogies. So our final room here, enormous painting. Uh, this is uh, the last communion, oh, sorry. Last communion of St. Joseph Colossans uh, came to, to North America for the first time. We had to rely on a higher power. We asked the help of the Archbishop of Boston, Sean O'Malley. He's not just an archbishop, he's a cardinal. And uh, he was you know, somewhat in the running to be pope last time. And he agreed to write a letter that arrived the same week as the letter from the MFA asking to borrow this painting from, uh, it's basically a religious school uh, in Madrid. And the point was that it would not just be a fitting conclusion to the exhibition, but a spiritual and theological gift to the people of Boston. So able, able, to, able to borrow that. 
and we paired it with another portrait, another self-portrait. So you see, we began the show with self-portraits, we end with a self-portrait, we began with a chocolate brown, we added a little bit more red into this last room, more kind of an eggplant or aubergine color, but to make you think you've come uh, full circle. And uh, we used, of course, this room, we called it Solo Goya. The point being, what only was Goya capable of? What was distinctive to Goya? And so I'll show you one last set. This was a set of the giant and one of the wonderful themes that Stephanie devised and I helped her uh, uh, figure out, finalize. And the idea of the giant, because Goya, just imagine the time he lived in, right? Invasions, kings come and go, institutions are challenged. And in all of this is a lot of play about power, who's in charge. And I think in a series that we developed on the giant, we sh can show him his meditation on this theme. First one's a tapestry cartoon, the little giants, right? There is one boy on top, he's having a great time. The boy holding him up, not so much fun, right? And this tells us a very important thing about power, that power is based on subjugation. If someone's in charge, someone else is holding him up, right? And this is played out all around the world. You can see that even the curvature of the earth implied there, and then another boy on top, another one holding him up. Or see this great print uh, from the Capriccio series, to rise and to fall. And this reminds us that someday, you know, the rulers are going up. The next day, they may be going down. And so power is short-lived. An amazing print from the Disparate series. You see this huge phantom looming over these soldiers, Incidentally, it's a similar costume in a way. It's with a kind of a big tr uh, X on the costume, the uniform to the soldier in the previous print. Um, but this is this huge figure, and they, as they're terrified, they jump over each other and uh, stumble to get away. So this reminds us and tells us that power is often based on fear. But if you look closely at that right sleeve there, you see a little face peeking out, right? That's not a giant. It's a bunch of guys on stilts covered with sheets, right? The whole thing is a hoax. And so this is Goya telling us that power, though it can be terrifying, may also be ultimately hollow. And we ended this sequence, and indeed ended this exhibition, with our great uh, print of the seated giant. Um, small work of art, but we gave it extra emphasis with a special little bump out wall, a fancier frame, the kind you'd mostly use for a painting, and marginally brighter lighting. So when you w looked in the room and scanned the wall, it stood out. And for us, this is such a rare print, and it, it, but it's so important, because if you could sum up Goya in one image, uh, this would do pretty well. Uh, it's very inventive and experimental in its process. It's pure aquatint. There's no lines in this. This is all patches of tone. It's wonderful, all gradations of light and dark to make this. And you see this figure. This is the biggest giant by far. This giant is so large that he sits. You can see the earth is curving beneath him. You know, he's the scale of a planet, and though he looks incomparably strong, he seems conflicted. His body is facing one way, his head turns back the other way, indecisive. And this reminds us that power is not all-powerful. Power, in fact, can be paralyzing. So we'll end with the giant here, trapped between order and disorder. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Xavier Bray, who has been Chief Curator at Dulwich Picture Gallery since January of 2011. He has held previous appointments at the National Gallery in London and the Museum of Fine Arts in Bilbao. He curated his first solo show, The Sacred Made Real, Spanish Painting and Sculpture, 1600 to 1700, in 2009 at the National Gallery in London and in Washington. Since he has been at Dulwich, he has curated an, an exhibition on Murillo um, and is now working on an exhibition of Goya's portraits for the National Gallery due to open in autumn of 2015. Today, he will speak to us about Goya's portraits, an exhibition in the making. Thank you very much. Um, luckily for Frederick, I'm a very forgiving man. When I got a phone call from Boston, from Stephanie and uh, Frederick, telling me that they'd moved their exhibition to a year before mine, I was crestfallen. But luckily I'm a fighter, and luckily I have great colleagues who helped help me, and luckily with Boston we managed to find a middle way, as one does in life. 
Um, but what I'm going to try and tell you, I, unfortunately, this is an exhibition, an exhibition, the meeting in the making. Sorry, it's very much happening at the moment. I'm still negotiating. Certain loans, as you'll see, came to Boston, and as a result, are difficult to convince lenders to come to London just a year after. But we're getting there. And what I want to do in this short 30 minutes is to share with you some ideas about a guy, the portrait painter, uh, but also show you how one goes about. Uh, bringing together about 50 pictures and drawings. Now, the thing about Guy, the portrait painter, it, it's a fascinating subject to, to go into. He, there are about 200-plus uh, portraits that survived by him. Um, and, of course, one has to select the best, and you also want to tell a story about his career as a portrait painter. Um, the British love portraiture, so that is why the National Gallery saw this as a good exhibition to do, but also because the National Gallery has got portraits by Goya, so it was a, an opportunity to put them into context, and also to show how extraordinary he was as a portraitist in comparison to painters like Gainsborough and Reynolds, who I don't have much time for compared to what Goya was able to produce. Now, the, the extraordinary thing about Goya is that he started very late in his career as a portrait painter. He only got his first commission in his mid-30s. Um, it's probably circumstance, but it is true that he was pretty much a self-taught painter. He tried to get into the Royal Academy in Madrid on two occasions and got rejected, therefore went to Italy on his own account, paid for his own trip, um, and returned to become pretty much a religious painter. Luckily, he was invited to Madrid in the mid-1770s, uh, by his brother-in-law and Mengs, the court painter, to paint tapestry cartoons. And that's what launched him, uh, really, to, to sort of try and get into the court circles and eventually become a court painter. But the whole skill as, of the portraitist came very much later on. And one portrait that Boston wasn't able to get is uh, this very beautiful self-portrait, which comes from Saragossa, which actually they said no to me three times. Uh, but uh, I insisted because it's key to the career of the portrait painter in his um, life because, one, it's a self-portrait, two, it's his earliest surviving portrait, um, painted around 1780. It shows this young man, his hair um, completely undone. He had long hair at that time that he would normally tie up in a, in a bunch at the back. Um, he looks at you quite sternly, but it's a very um, kind-looking uh, face, I find. A slightly podgy, snub nose, which he remarked upon when he wrote about the way he looked to his very good friend, Martin Sabater. Um, and then this beautiful light that falls across this face. Um, this, we don't know who he did it for, whether it was for himself, but it is the first um, portrait that we have. Now, Gaia, when, uh, what we, we're going to try and do in this um, um, exhibition... Uh, um, is really tell his story as a portrait painter from the beginning to end. And what is remarkable is how he gets better and better as he goes along. And like Frederick, what he was saying about Tintoretto, his, the beginnings are quite stilted, they're quite uh, naive almost. He almost puts, puts too much into his compositions. For example, the Count of Florida Blanca, uh, which Frederick and Stephanie kindly allowed me to, to borrow uh, so it didn't go to Boston, will be coming from the Bank of Spain. And it shows Goya um, standing there with a canvas, presenting it to the prime minister of, of Charles III, uh, Florida Blanca. He's being interrupted in his administrative duties. Um, and th there's a clock ticking away that marks the time. There's a portrait of Charles III at the back. There's a, a, an engineer that they're looking over the plans for the canal of Aragon. There's almost too much. And then Goya has accidentally dropped a note saying Goya made this. So he's really trying his, his, his best. And he was. This is 1783. He really wants to get in there. Right across the end of his career, so 1783 to 1824, when Goya leaves um, Madrid um, to um, live in self-imposed exile in Bordeaux, and is greeted by his very good friend, Moratin, the playwright who had been in exile for, for quite a long time by then. Moratin, we know from letters, says that Goya arrived exhausted but ate like a student and still has much energy and is ready to go to Paris. I'm trying to tell him to relax because it's going to get cold and tell him to come back soon because the winters are hard in France. But this is one of the most evocative portraits of a very good friend, very simple. You can see that in a matter of, of, of 40 years, he's completely uh, developed, not only stylistically, but also in the way he paints 
the, not just the face, but also the, the actual this insight into the person. Goya was generally interested in people. He wanted to get to know them. And you get this in his portraits. You really feel that he invested a lot of time and energy in, in trying to understand what these people were all about and how he could possibly conjure that up into paint. So that's the aim of the show, is to, with a selection of very high quality portraits to tell the Goya portrait story. And it's something that I, I feel Guy would have been very proud about, because he did see himself as, as the heir to Velasquez, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. But there hadn't been a great portrait painter since Velasquez. Um, and this was very much his, his big sort of um, ambition. And although the beautiful caprichos and the, the, the engravings upstairs, the private albums, uh, provi provide a very intimate and private look into Guy's mind, the portraits are the more official, the more public Goya. And in a way, they mark his career very, in a very sort of beautiful, solemn way. Um, he was very selective of, of who he painted. He wasn't really a society painter like Gainsborough Reynolds. He was somebody that uh, every portrait mattered. And every portrait, as you'll see, is totally different from the other. He was not formulaic. Now, when Goya came onto the scene, this is a kind of portraiture that was accepted. This is Louis Michel Van Loo's painting of the family of Philip V. Uh, Philip V is sitting there in the middle next to his wife, Isabelle de Farnese, and, and then the whole Bourbon family. It's grand, it's operatic, it's um, scenic, it's a bit like the Met Opera live. Um, <laughs> the, when Guy arrived in Madrid, the man who was appointed the first court painter to Charles III was Anton Raphael Mengs. He was the only one supposedly allowed to paint portraits of the royal family. He'd been brought in from, well, he lived in Italy, but he was actually German in origin. Um, very strict painter, he was, he was a good painter, but, um, and Goya admired him and, and wanted to emulate him. And you can see the self-portrait that we saw earlier has a very interesting connection with this very beautiful self-portrait by, by Mengs. But he was a classical artist, drawing first, uh, study nature first, and then idealize it. And so the portraits that he came up with are uh, portraits like this. So this is uh, the young Ferdinand, uh, prince of uh, Naples and you can see it's all about posture it's about the it's more about the table on the left this beautifully rich gilded table the crown on the on top of it this architecture and it's quite hard in a way to to actually feel anything for this young boy I mean it's a beautifully painted picture but it has none of the um, insights that Goya will be able to produce later and this is uh, Mengs's official portrait by, um, um, of Charles III with his armor pointing grandly. And you can see it's all about finish. It's polished. It's, it's, I, I like it, but um, it, you don't get <laughs> much into it. Now, I did compare this with Goya's portrait of Charles III, which he did probably based on this. Um, and it's extraordinary what happens. Um, and I'll flick backwards and forwards, because it, it is extraordinary <laughs> to see how, I, and this is something I haven't yet explained, how does Goya get away with it um, because of this realism? This, this is something that he, it's inbuilt in him. He paints uh, to a certain degree what he sees or what he feels he should represent. And um, there is an extra wrinkle, I'm sorry, but uh, the wrinkles have been slightly pulled back here. But there is a wrinkle around his lip. And it's, at the same time, it's, it's a ruddy-looking fellow who loved hunting. And Charles was a very humane king. He was known as uh, Carlos, uh, Primer Carlos Guerre, first Charles, then king. So he wanted to be uh, loved by his people. And um, I'll talk about this in a minute. But the, the main thing here is that Goya is looking back to one single artist. And it happens to be the great Velázquez, which, of course, all the royal portraits were hanging in the royal palace in Madrid. Guy actually made a point of, of making copies of them. This is a red chalk drawing on the right, a small drawing in preparation for a whole series of etchings that he made of all the uh, royal portraits. And I think as he was copying them, he got to see the technique, got to see the style, and also got, to in, uh, got interested in this whole idea of the inform, informal portrait that then gets turned into the official portrait. And here we have Philip IV in his hunting costume. And here we have Charles III in his uh, um, hunting costume. And you can see what he's looking at, but then he's not just copying. He's breathing uh, the sort of Velasquez uh, technique into this picture. And we have um, this, this man standing with his gun. The gun is beautifully depicted. And we've spoken to um, gun experts in Madrid who will tell you that that is exactly the gun that Charles III went hunting with. Um, the glove, I just love the way the glove just hangs in a very... Um, 
relaxed way um, while the dog is fast asleep on the, on the left. And he looks at you with these sort of ruddy looking uh, cheeks in, in a very uh, humane way. What I've been able to discover while researching this is that it is very likely that this portrait was commissioned. This is the, uh, I've managed to borrow it, it's from a private collection. And it was commissioned probably by the Conde de Fernand Núñez, who wrote the biography of Charles III. He was an ambassador, but also very fond of Charles III. And it's possible that he gave Goya this commission, uh, basing it on the mangs that we saw earlier. So it's not a royal commission for the king. It's actually a commission for an admirer of Charles III, which is an interesting way of thinking about this portrait. Now, of course, Las Meninas by Velázquez was a sort of um, a talisman for Goya. He respected it. He copied it in his uh, etching. Um, and... Um, very much learnt everything from it, and it's very likely to have been the main source, along with other things, which I'm not going to go into now, for his great portrait of the family of in, the Infante Don Luis um, um, with his um, uh, courtiers and, and servants. Um, it's a, an extraordinary picture, and as Frederick said, it, it lives in this uh, small place just outside Parma, and if it had stayed in Spain, it probably be a picture in the Prada and probably would never get lent because it is his first masterpiece. But because it was bought by a pastor magnate in, uh, in Parma, uh, it travels the whole time. And we, of course, are desperate to borrow it. And I'm still negotiating. But because it traveled to Boston, um, the Magnani Roca felt it was very... They said no five times, saying that it's too fragile to travel again. But... Having said that, we are still um, negotiating, <laughs> and uh, we will, um, having seen what Frederick had to pull up for uh, all those prints of toulouse lautrec we've, um, we've come up with um, a Van Gogh. So, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> so this is what you have to do to, to get these loans. Um, but it will be in the first room of the show, and it will be a great opportunity to bring together all the other pictures that Gaia painted when he traveled, especially to a small place, a mountain place called Arenas de San Pedro, to visit this uh, Don Luis who was living in exile. You um, are very fortunate to have a portrait of him as a young boy. He was made a cardinal at the age of five and then the Archbishop of Seville, age of nine. And you've got the portrait of him in his red robes in the, um, common, is it the special gallery around where we had supper last night. Um, he eventually he loved women and eventually he d decided to leave the church and dedicate himself to a courtly life. Great collector, loved music. Um, but one day he got caught up a tree with a, a prostitute and was sent into exile by his elder brother, King Charles III, and that's where he was living, in this small palace um, in an improvised court. And he invited Gaia to come and paint him. And it's, it was probably the most um, sort of adventurous thing one could do at the time, to invite a, a young painter with not much of a reputation yet as a portraitist to come and paint the whole family. Um, and here we see Goya at his canvas. The canvas is likely to be the picture we see. Um, uh, Phil, um, in the infant Don Luis playing a game of solitaire while his wife, who was 32 younger than he, uh, is having her hair done. And then there are two, uh, two children behind Don Luis in... Um, let's see if I can use this. I, I don't want... How do you do it, Frederick? <laughs> that one there. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so you've got the, the little Don Luis, who you'll see in a minute, because the guy did individual portraits of each of these mm -hmm. members, then the little Mar uh, Maria Teresa, and then the uh, little um, um, Maria Fernanda here. And then these courtiers, and we've never really fully worked out who exactly they are, uh, but we do know so, some of the names of the, um, of the hairdressers, uh, which I won't go into now, but it's, it's an extraordinary sort of um, informal scene of, of a court in a relaxed manner, uh, do, going about their daily um, um, activities. And yet God turns it into a formal portrait of, of a family. And I can't wait to see this, along with the possible sketch of um, the Infante Don Luis that was painted between 9 and 11 uh, in 1783 um, in the morning. So we, he writes that at the back of the picture. Very uh, direct representation of him. Or the very beautiful portrait which will be coming from a Mexican collection of uh, Maria Teresa de Valabriga. This is on panel, and you can see he's wiped his brush on the sides as, as he's working on, on her face. This is Goya trying to get reality, but also beautify reality by making the, the eyebrows very uh, classical. So there's a sort of interesting uh, contradiction in this style where he is quite real, but at the same time, with, particularly with women portraits, likes to slightly idealize 
the face. Um, and of course, this wonderful portrait of little Don Luis with a, a puzzle, holding a puzzle, um, which was in the private collection for a long time, but is now in Saragossa in the museum. So we're going to. This is the first room, essentially, of the room of the exhibition where we'll bring um, these, this commission together. Um, and this is uh, something that um, Guy tended to do. He would do individual portraits of the family and then bring them all together as a group family portrait. And he did that um, several times in his career. Um, in the most magnificent pictures, because it's unlined, it's never been um, lined with another canvas behind it, which sometimes results in flattening the, the picture. So it's an incredibly beautiful surface. And it shows the Duke of Asuna, his wife, the Duchess of Benavente, and their four children. Um, both were remarkable, um, enlightened uh, members of the aristocracy, believed in reading literature, brought in French books into Spain, um, were great uh, lovers of the arts, music, and, and also uh, very um, um, involved with um, reforms, economic reforms. Um, and they employed Goya to, to, to produce this, this marvelous portrait of the family. And it's um, a portrait that when you get close, it's, it's very direct. There's a sense of a, of a snapshot quality um, as they look at you. Uh, and yet, at the same time, it's full of the luxury that you would expect. Uh, this beautiful um, uh, blue coat, these wonderful miniatures on the side here. Now, this is a picture that belongs now to the Prado. It's one of the greatest Goyas. And it's the one that, for me, had to come to London because it has a wonderful affinity with Gainsborough, very different to Gainsborough. Um, but um, we do know that uh, the Dukes of Osuna collected British prints. Um, some of them were British portraits, Benjamin West among them. Um, interestingly, this is a, a painting now in the Tate Gallery um, that shows the Bailly family, a uh, very large group portrait. And it was possibly known through these colored mezzo tints, which we do know traveled around. I don't know if Goy actually saw this mezzo tint, but it's very interesting to compare and, and contrast really how different Goy is to uh, Gainsborough, but how Goy would have been fascinated by this informal group portrait um, as, as, his, as a guide. And the, the difficulty of painting people together is, is for me nicely summed up in this contemporary, <laughs> uh, f I presume they're American family, um, of uh, the father, son, you know, father and mother all sitting down. How, how do you actually go about doing a group family? And I think Gaia really does it in a very natural way uh, with his, it's a very, a very sort of intimate way. And he got to know the family very well. He would spend time with them and he keeps in t touch with them throughout his life. Um, and you'll see in a minute that he will paint her um, later on when she became the Marquesa de Santa Cruz. Um, and to uh, complement the group portrait, we've managed to borrow this very beautiful, a terrible slide uh, portrait of the, the Condesa de Benavente. She was uh, a great lover of French fashion, and here she's dressed in a Marie Antoinette um, uh, style, uh, a woman of great culture. It's, a, again, a picture that get, gets very rarely seen, it's in a, it, and it's in a wonderful condition. And it had a pendant. It's uh, yet to be found, but we're going to hang it um, with uh, the Duke of Osuna, painted much later in the 1790s, um, which is also a remarkable picture because it's so informal. He's uh, there with his piece of paper but looks out. Uh, it's as if they're having a conversation. Um, and the style in which it's painted suddenly has become much looser. Um, and um, extremely expressive and very economic in the, in the way of painting. Um, but it's going to be very interesting to con con be able to contrast and reunite family portraits such as this one. And as I said, the little daughter, the second um, daughter, um, posed much later on in 1805 um, for Gaia. And this is a portrait I've just written about. And it's a very difficult picture to explain. Some, uh, some people find it very awkward, the way she lies across this red uh, sofa. Um, but she is represented as, uh, as Terpsichor, the um, muse of music and choral singing, with her harp and her, her garland of, of um, vine leaves and grapes. So she's a sort of classical goddess. But what Goya does, unlike, say, David uh, in France, where he would create this room and a, a proper sofa and give you a sense of space, Goya really pushes her up. And you, still, you feel that you're still in his studio space. He doesn't... Uh, uh, sort of go further in, in order to adorn a, a portrait. He makes it very direct. And for me, this makes 
by one of the great moderns of portraiture, um, looking almost forced to Manet's Olympia uh, in the way that uh, this woman is laid out. And I think there was a, an extraordinary trust between uh, Goya's patrons, particularly the Osunas, and, and Goya himself, and, and the kind of portraits he would come up with. There was nothing like this in Spain, and, very, and David is the closest, but this kind of directness um, is very much uh, one of the great characteristics of Goya's work. Now, of course, if I'd asked for this from the Prado, they would have laughed at me, and they would have probably told me to cancel the show. But this is the <laughs> famous uh, family group portrait of, um, of Charles IV. Um, and this is, of course, the, the great moment for Guy when he is, in 1799, named first court painter. Unfortunately, he had to share it with a, a colleague of his called Maelia, who was no good at all. But I think that was a political decision. But uh, he totally, totally takes over and paints a whole series of wonderful portraits of Maria Luisa, the Queen, and Charles IV, and the, the whole family. And again, Goya, like Velázquez, likes to put himself at the back with his canvas. Um, it's a fascinating portrait, which I, I write about in the essay, um, and it could be a book in itself. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting to, to look at the dynamics within the, portrait, the group portraits. It's quite a shallow space. The Queen is, is very much the center stage uh, with uh, holding her, her eldest daughter by the arm and then her youngest uh, son with, by the hand. But actually, when you start looking, you'll see that Charles IV has stepped forward a bit alongside his son, Ferdinand. So there is respect for the, the hierarchy of him as king of, of Spain and his, the heir to the throne. And I think this is it's important because, of course, in the 19th century, French visitors would call this the family of a butcher. They, they thought they were so unregal, so direct. But it's important to realize that you know, this is the, 1799, the French Revolution has, has gone by. There's been terrible changes. The king's cousin, Louis XVI, was beheaded. Um, so the, it's very important for the royal family in Spain to show themselves as, as people that you could relate to in, on human terms. And Guy is the perfect painter to, to relate to that concept of people that you are part of their own time. Yes, they are the absolute monarchs, the divine right of king, but at the same time, they are there to, to serve you. Um, so because I can't borrow this, there are two portraits that are key to, to the show, and, and I'm still waiting for an answer. Uh, but they come from the Royal Palace of Madrid, and they show Charles IV in his hunting costume. He loved hunting and spent most of his time hunting like his father. And I'm hoping to, uh, what I'm going to do is hang the portrait of Charles III, his dad, next to his son. Uh, this time the hunting dog is more alert, looking up. Um, but they are meant to be uh, informal portraits and yet official portraits of the king. And then his que the queen, Maria Luisa, wearing the mantilla. Again, a great way of, of trying to associate herself with Spanish dress. Rather than wearing French dress, she's wearing the mantilla. Um, and she was apparently extremely proud of her beautiful long arms. And of course, Goya uh, pays homage to that. So I'm still awaiting. This has been a very difficult loan to negotiate. Uh, the, the Royal Museum uh, or the Royal Palace in Madrid has opened the museum. And of course, they want this to be their centerpiece. They are due to open exactly at the same time as the exhibition in London. But I'm hoping that in true Spanish style, they will be late and delayed. <laughs> and, uh, so I, this is what I'm hoping to hear. I should probably when I come back uh, next week. Um, another section that I'm particularly interested in, in, in um, looking at and um, thinking about is Goya as a painter of, of the Spanish Enlightenment. And this is a sort of homage to the great Boston show back in the 1980s, of, uh, which looked at that theme. Uh, but Goya um, not only painted himself in this beautiful self-portrait, which is now in the Royal Academy in, in Spain, um, but it's about this idea of light, of the idea of him uh, being part of a movement who wanted to bring reform, both politically and religiously, in Spain. And he, he uh, was very um, close to some of these figures, and there will be a room dedicated to um, such characters. Um, what's interesting is that Goya, one of the few prints he, he had in his own collection that was inventoried later in 1812, was a portrait of William Pitt, the elder, the great Brit British politician. Um, I, we don't know why he had it, but um, it's very interesting from a portrait point of view of, of this Englishman sitting, standing, sitting there with his papers um, interrupted at work. And it's something that he doesn't copy, but he reworks in different ways in some of his most fantastic portraits, such as the Jovellanos. He was the Minister of Peace and Justice, 
um, in 1797, a very short moment in Spanish history where suddenly um, the um, uh, Spanish sort of po politics were given a chance to um, balance out the, the monarchy with a, a group of people that was going to bring reform into Spanish society. And so Jovellanos was commissioned, commissioned this in 1797. Um, him at his desk, um, interrupted, but also in deep thought, thinking of ways of how to make things better in Spain to be paired with a very interesting portrait that very rarely makes Goya exhibitions uh, of the Minister of Finance, Francisco Saavedra, which belongs to the uh, um, Courtauld Institute. And this has been very exciting because it's a, a picture that hangs among lots of great Gainsboroughs. Um, it's usually hung against the window, so you don't see very much. And what we've done is that we've clean, they've cleaned it, there, and I'm afraid I, it hasn't yet been finished, so this is before cleaning. But you just, you'll be amazed if you come to London and see the show, how the blues have come out, how the, the movement and the excitement of the surface has been um, captured. And he is a much more sort of pragmatic kind of ca character. You can see that, yes, you've disturbed him, but he wants to get on with his paperwork compared to Jovellans. But they were meant to be seen together, so it'll be fascinating to bring them together for the first time. Um, what's been interesting as well, we've done an infrared reflectography of the, of the painting, and you can see how with quick <coughs> sketches of black, he would uh, give shape to the, um, to the body, then he would probably attack the face first, um, and then paint with black around it to give it more sort of uh, prominence, and the rest is done with extraordinary sort of looseness and cursive um, uh, approach to, to paint the papers and the inkwell, and it's done with extraordinary confidence. And it leads on very beautifully to the portrait you have upstairs, the 1798 portrait of a, of a French diplomat who could only be French with his French uh, sort of tricolore, the f blue, white, and red, and the hat and the plumes and the, and around, and the sash around his waist. Um, and the pose is fascinating. We were talking about this yesterday with um, the Gaia scholars of this, where this pose comes from. Why is it possible to get to, to this pose? Why does he give it to Guillaume Mardet? And we, why does he go for much more simple poses in the Saavedra, and perhaps less so with the Jovellanos? But to see them all three together, I think will be very interesting to, to look at the dynamics and how Goy goes about uh, making his uh, sitters literally sit. Now, hunting is a big theme in Goy's life. We know that he loved it himself. Um, he would show off to his friend Martin Zapater in his letters, such as this one, that you know, he'd killed um, three uh, partridges, two um, woodcocks and five uh, rabbits, um, always showing off, talking, he loved his dogs more than, I think, his wife probably. Um, and uh, indeed, in the, in the portrait of his friend, and these are very different portraits to, the, um, to those royal portraits or the aristocratic portraits or the polit politician's portrait. And this is Sapater, and it's uh, one of the most beautiful portraits, which is in Bilbao. Um, he uses the uh, oval format as a way of zooming into his friend, there's nothing else really to, to concentrate on except for the face and perhaps the signature, Goya to his friend, Sabater, so it's dedicated. He's got this most wonderful big nose, um, like a good northern Spaniard would have. He was a great merchant and very, a very wealthy businessman, but loved Goya dearly, and together they, um, they, um, they wrote about um, to each other throughout the, his life until he died in 1803. But the, the, coming back to the theme of hunting, it occurred to me that, um, it, like Gaia, it was a great way of fitting into circles that normally would be closed to him. And indeed, there are still some wonderful portraits by Gaia that um, are um, with the families that originally commissioned them, and they very rarely get out. And so, um, I, as a joke, it began as a joke, I told one of my patrons, listen, I need to learn how to shoot, uh, because... Um, you know, I'm, I've never done it before, and uh, if I get invited to a Spanish shoot, I should be able to show off. So here is uh, Dr. Xavier Bray. Oops, sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, le learning to shoot, and uh, some of my colleagues would be appalled to see this uh, uh, bloodthirsty uh, man. But um, it was an extraordinary experience, not only to get to know Goya in a different way, because he did show off about... I only got two, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, it, it sort of also shed light on the Charles III portrait and the whole p way of posing with your... Uh, this is not my gun, it's my hunting stick. But uh, it was very interesting. And unfortunately, it didn't help with one of the major loans that I wanted to get, which was from the Alba collection. 
um, which is, of course, the great portrait of the Duchess of Alba. Um, I, I'm not suggesting I wanted to go hunting with uh, the Duchess of Alba, who sadly passed away, but her son, uh, the Duke of Westgard, now the Duke of Alba, uh, would have been the right person to go shooting with in order to then convince him at the end of the shoot whether he would lend his Duchess of Alba. Now, of course, you will all know that uh, I'm very pleased for the Meadows Museum, but she will be coming here uh, this autumn at the same time as my exhibition. So my shooting skills did not uh, help out on this one. I don't know how you did it, Mark, but uh, <laughs> you must be a very good shot. But um, uh, she, she is coming here, and it, it's, it's, it'll be wonderful to see her hand, and I know that uh, Mark has come up with a fantastic context for her. Um, and, of course, it's a picture that, for us, would have been amazing to, to include. Um, but in the end, one has to know when to give up. So I've given up on that one. Um, and there is another portrait of her that Boston amazingly managed to convince the Hispanic Society to, to lend, but they've told me that it can't travel again. So that's fine. So instead, I concentrated on the Count of Fernand Núñez and his wife. Um, and that worked. The shooting worked. And uh, I was able to, we were able to borrow these very beautiful pendant portraits of the Count of Fernand Núñez <coughs> and his wife, the Countess, uh, which still belong to the family. Um, and they're some of the most marvelous pictures, a beautiful state of, of preservation. Um, this is Goya doing something quite different with his portraits, probably inspired by the portraits of the king and queen in hunting costume by setting them out in these wonderful landscapes. Um, which connect is something that I only realized, but they, they sort of connect to each other. So they not only work together, but they actually unite together. Um, she's sitting with her mantilla uh, while he is standing in this extraordinary pose, which looks more like a British portrait than anything else. And how Goya, again, must have been British prince. Uh, it reminds me of a Thomas Lawrence portrait. Um, what's fascinating is when you start reading about this couple, they couldn't stand each other. They, he was in love with somebody else and went off with her, and she was in love with somebody else and eventually married him when he died in 1822. So there's extraordinary intrigue when you get into these portraits, which I'm trying to, to get. Of course, one has to be very careful not to read too much into them. And also, one has to question, to what extent did Goya know anything about this? I, I, I'm sure he did know everything about their private lives. But... What's extraordinary is how in the portraits, all that is slightly pushed aside and uh, we're presented with these magnificent, uh, this magnificent couple. One other portrait that's been very exciting to, to find um, was a portrait that was recently sold by the family in Spain to a, a very prominent collector in Spain, um, something called Villamir, and he's very kindly reserved this picture for the exhibition so we'll be able to show it for the first time publicly. And it's of a, a man that we know very little about, Mo Valentin Mon uh, Belvis de Moncada, a military man who probably had just uh, married, and there must have been a pendant portrait to this. Uh, but he's dressed in this beautiful silk white suit. Very simple portrait. Um, um, the focus is all on this wonderful head that could only be a Spanish ma man with these dark eyebrows and this wonderful long hair, um, big open brown eyes. Um, it's an ext extraordinary portrait, particularly the way he uses the space at the back. Uh, there's so much space above him and around him um, that um, it's sort of, he's almost floating, and yet with the shadows, he's able to create a backdrop that uh, locates him in space. Um, but when you get close, the, the details of the, the face and, and the way it's painted so simply and yet so, um, so it captures really the, 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 the sort of thoughts of this man, and, and that even the hands uh, are, are marvelously painted, sort of almost sort of calligraphic a way of painting. So this is going to be a very exciting part of the show, is to, to pre present these, these kind of portraits. Back home in London, in Nashgari, of course, we've got the, the portrait of the Duke of Wellington, uh, who arrived in Madrid in August 1812, victorious, and was, of course, acclaimed by the Spanish, and the Royal Academy straight away wanted Guy to paint his portrait and exhibit a big equestrian portrait in its rooms. This is a smaller portrait that got, um, Wellington likely took back with him. Um, it's painted on panel, which is interesting, with all his medals that he was eventually given. But what I'm more interested in is the drawing that is in the British Museum. And we're going to put these together, not for the first time, but definitely for the first time in this portrait context. And the drawings are, are another aspect of Gaia's portraits that um, I, I hadn't really fully um, appreciated. But they are... Um, yet another way into his, his artistic um, prowess as a portraitist, but they're even more immediate. And this, is, this is, for me, is 
the real Wellington. He looks exhausted compared to what we see here, where he's slightly uh, pushed up. Um, the, of course, the medals are not in yet because that's irrelevant at this stage. What's important is the likeness of, 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 of Wellington. Um, and the same goes for other drawings that we've, we're going to try and borrow. This is Theán Bermúdez, his very inter great friend who collected prints and drawings and would have, uh, was one of the main sponsors in Goya's art. Um, but it's almost like a passport photograph in the way you've got the double chin, these bushy eyebrows, the way he looks at you intensely. But um, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary piece. And then his wife, Josefa Bayou, this black chalk drawing, um, which is taken from the side. Um, she was a, a long-suffering wife, had seven, uh, sti six stillborns and one son, Javier. Um, and she, she said in a letter, well, Goya's remarks on what she said, that you know, the, the, wom uh, the woman's role in the, at home is, is like a tomb. Um, and you can still feel that, that she sits there against this sort of kitchen chair. Um, a very, very real uh, aspect of, of his portraits. Now, the, the, because of the sequence, because I'm trying to tell the story of Goya, the portrait painter, right for his career, there are key moments when he goes back to his duties as court painter. And indeed, in 1815, 1814, when Ferdinand returns to take the throne of Spain following the, uh, Napoleon's defeat at the Battle of Waterloo, um, a guy is back on duty and has to paint this extraordinary portrait of, of Ferdinand. And you, uh, we, we know that Guy didn't much like him, but uh, he gives him all the accoutrements of royalty, the, the um, baton, the gilded baton, these extraordinary robes of the order of the Golden Fleece. Um, this is the victorious general the king who's come back. Um, no, he was known as El Deseado, the desired one. Um, and Goya's, uh, this is a way that Goya's last great royal portrait. And it's, the way it's painted, it's very thick, very almost uh, uh, impastos on impastos. Um, he's really laid everything out for it. Um, and it's gonna be, it's, it is one of his last uh, main, main sort of royal commissions. And indeed, 1819 is when uh, he has this terrible illness and almost dies and paints as a thank you, an ex voto, to his friend Dr. Arrieta, this very uh, profound portrait um, of Gaia being held by Arrieta. And this, uh, thank God, is, is coming to the show as well, having been to Boston uh, from Minneapolis. It's one of the key, key loads. And I'm hoping to hang it so that you can see the first room of the show with Don Luis and the young Gaia ready for action. And then this uh, with Gaia at the end of his life. So it'll be very interesting to see stylistically how far he's gone, but also um, the kind of portraits he, he, he was to paint. Um, and then, of course, he survives. He's still got energy. He's ready to, to learn more. In 1824, before he leaves for Bordeaux, he does these extraordinary drawings of Javier Goya, his son, who looks rather sickly, and of, of Francisco Otin. I know very little about Otin, except that he was related somehow to another of Goya's sitter. But it's uh, one of the most beautiful black chalk drawings with this hair ruffled towards the front, this moustache. It almost looks forward to Manet's own portraits of the 1860s. So the last part of the show, the last room, is Goya going into a much more smaller circle, his own circle of, of friends and family, uh, but also his ex self-imposed exile in Bordeaux, where the, 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 the sort of temperature cools down of, in his portraits, but at the same time they become all the more intimate. And he goes to Bordeaux, learns lithography, or perfects the skills in, in lithography, does this wonderful portrait of Goulon, one of his, uh, 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 somebody who was actually very uh, well skilled in that art form and taught guy how to, to work it. And then did this amazing portrait, which will be very interesting to see next to the drawings, how the drawing translates into lithography, but also how it translates into his portraits of the time. And these were painted in 1824, probably in Paris, of the Ferrer couple. Ferrer were uh, very um, extreme liberals who were living in exile in, in Paris, and Gaia was looking at, to at them as potential patrons for more work, and did these two very, very special portraits. Now, it was very important for the show to end with one of his last pictures, which is the 1827 portrait of um, Muguiro, 1827, a year before he dies in 1828. And what's amazing, this is his last documented painting, which happens to be a portrait. There is a beautiful inscription at the bottom here that says, uh, I painted this at the age of 81 um, um, in Bordeaux. And this is Muguira, his financial advisor. Guy was obsessed by making sure that his pensions were all lined up. He even actually came back to 
well, I came back to Madrid on two occasions to sign the necessary papers for uh, claiming his pension. Um, but unfortunately, this is a portrait that belongs to the Prada, and it's unlined and is very fragile, and they've said that it's impossible for it to move. So there is one solution, and this is where you are going to witness loan negotiating live. Mark, there is a great, <laughs> a great acquisition was made here last year of a very beautiful portrait <laughs> of Mariano, Mariano Goya, uh, which he painted when he traveled to Madrid in 1827, as you all will know by now. It's got this beautiful inscription at the back. Um, and it is a, a remarkable picture that has never been seen really in, in a, this kind of exhibition. And it would be a wonderful way to end the show. <laughs> uh, you don't have to say no, yeah, don't worry. Uh, I understand if you say no. But um, it's, it depends also on budget. Uh, the National Gallery had no idea that I'm doing this live. <laughs> Actually, there's live streaming, yeah. But um, it, of course, depends on the budget. But it, it is, it would really um, give the show a fantastic way of ending because it's as Frederick said you need to know how to begin well and you have to end well so I'll, I'll end here thank you very much <laughs>
um, the old Celestina, the procuress, the board who runs the brothel, uh, with a girl um, sitting on the chair, and everybody in lamentation, apparently over this little lap dog, uh, where the long caption below uh, tells you that the little dog has not done its duty all day. <laughs> but, the, but the satirical bent of that is that it's actually the girl who hasn't managed to catch and do what she's meant to be doing in that brothel all day and hence the lamentations all round. Um, that was very much in the vein um, of kind of, of 18th century caricature, where at the end of, in the 90s of the 18th century, um, and it was out of the album drawings in this second um, band album, as it was then, that Goya drew many, many subjects which he worked up in some preparatory drawings which he called dreams, um, with the intention of turning them into a print series. And we were looking uh, yesterday at these um, etchings which came from the dream series of drawings. Um, of course, they're no longer called dreams in the print series, but they are, you can identify them from these preparatory dream drawings which are all in the Prado, all on a website, excellent website of the Prado. Um, and they enable you to see a kind of sequence where Goya is moving from this album, which gradually, where the satire becomes harsher and sharper as he goes along, um, and then translates them into preparatory drawings for prints, and then the prints themselves. Then there's a kind of little hiatus, um, and there are two drawings. The, the, um, this, this album here, which is also in sequence as album C, so we've got A, B, C, um, this probably comes uh, quite a bit later, uh, most of it during the period of the war, and it has at the end of the album this extraordinary, terrifying sequence um, of uh, Inquisition scenes, um, of the harshest and most horrible punishments. Um, this girl, this woman, as you see, chained up uh, for being a liberal, which meant uh, not liberal as you mean it really, more as we mean it in the UK, which is simply um, people who are for enlightenment and education and transparency um, and not violent revolution. So she is album C, um, around 1808 to 14, something like that. And then the sequence that we originally had, that Eleanor Sear had devised, it breaks up a bit. And we put, or we put at the moment tentatively in that sequence, album F coming off to C. Um, this is a series of um, very disparate subjects. Um, they're very vigorously brushed. Um, they're on um, sheets um, of, uh, that they're in a they're in a bound book, which has had been previously used. And the reason we put these two together um, is that they are on less beautiful paper, um, rather ordinary paper. Um, one unbound um, sheets that he could renumber and retitle, um, and the other a bound volume but already used, so sort of secondhand volume. Um, and we think that this one, at the moment, we're not at all sure, but we think that it may have gone, he may have gone on using it um, right up to, into the 1820s. Then we pick up again um, from around 1820, probably earlier, in fact, um, probably coming after the bullfight prints, and along with the beginning of those disparates, which you see upstairs in their published form as pro proverbs, um, which we think are dated, they follow on from the bullfight prints, so dated roughly 1816 to maybe 1820, 22. Um, and these are the grandest drawings of all. They're on the largest sheets of paper. I've tried to give an idea of the different scales. Um, we don't know if this was a barren volume. That's something that is, remains to be discovered. Um, they're very finished drawings. They're very disparate subjects. They have a lot more going on in them, for the most part, um, than the others, which tend to be single figures or couples um, with little 
um, background, as it were, little environment. Um, but they are magnificent, and they will be um, the treasure of any museum collection. Um, and we are going to have five of them, including a newly discovered one um, in the exhibition at the Courtauld Gallery. So this is album E, and then we go backwards in the letters, but forward in time to album D. And this is the album that we are presenting, um, the first time that any album has been presented whole. Um, the drawing that you see there is the one that is in the Courtauld and gave rise to the idea of the show because they had a, an exhibition of Spanish drawings in their collection, which is very rich, um, a few years ago. And in the course of going round that show um, with the gallery director, he said, do you think there's something that we could do with our one Goya drawing? And I've been working on the drawings for a long, long time, trying to put the albums, as it were, virtually back together again. And I said, I think you probably could get all of album D together. And so we tried. Um, and it was a tall order, um, but we did succeed, as you'll see. And then there are two final albums, um, which we know were made in Bordeaux, uh, one of them has captions. This is the very, very famous one called Aun Aprendo, I'm Still Learning. And it's seen as a kind of allegorical self-portrait of Goya in his great old age, at the age of 80. And then the final one is on the same paper, um, but it's uh, without captions and often has uh, rather fanciful signatures. He writes his name again and again on them. Um, and that is an example of the extraordinary dynamism um, of this very ancient old man. I mean, this may have been made in the year before his death at the age of 82. So there you have the eight albums. And um, we are going to look mainly at what we have been able to do uh, with album B. Oh, I've switched off. I'm trying to go to the next slide which is there. So this is just a glimpse of the catalogue, which I have here. We only had three copies of the catalogue, and the bulk of the edition didn't arrive before I came, so I can't distribute any. Um, but they are now in the Courtauld Gallery, and of course they will be circulated and sent around. So there again you have the um, very wonderful, rather naughty drawing um, that is in the, in the Courtauld collection. It's number three in the series. You see Goya's number up top in pen and ink, and then there's a number above that, uh, which is a later collection number, which we'll have a look at. And what we've done is um, we've had, um, we've got essays which introduce sections. I did one on generally on the album. Um, Mark uh, MacDonald wrote about the relationship between the prints and drawings, and here's the famous um, Dream of Reason, and its preparatory drawing, the Sueño number one. Uh, so this is all discussed in their relation to the, to the album. Um, Reva Wolf has done a lovely essay on um, particularly of, of focusing on subject matter and on the famous Celestina, the board, um, which she goes into a great detail, and uh, the accounts um, of uh, Padre Isla, and a whole context, a literary context, which is very, very important for Goya's drawings, um, because we're gradually discovering um, sources, meanings in drawings that otherwise seem uh, quite incomprehensible, particularly album B, which has um, very brief captions. This one is called um, Singing and Dancing. And this is presumably some kind of a religious figure. Um, the levitating figure above her, up whose skirts she's looking with such uh, interest, um, ha has been anointed, <coughs> probably anointed with um, some kind of potion, uh, some magical potion to make her levitate in the air. And this album, um, when we 
showed pages from it in 2001 at the Hayward Gallery. None of these albums, as I said earlier, had a title. D Goya didn't um, title them at all. He gave t captions to, to the pages in not all but some of them. Um, but the, 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 the reason for the lettering uh, that Ellen Nasser gave to them, A to H, was simply a way to identify them. And of course, once the lettering had got out of chronological order, as it were, um, I thought, well, maybe we can have um, sort of titles that will help us to identify them when we talk about them. And the Inquisition album is one that had been frequently used. This one had never had a title, and I called it the Witches and Old Women album, um, because there are a lot of witches and there are a lot of old women. Um, and it's a way, it's just a way of, of, of naming it, in a sense. Um, so um, th there, are, there are essays that precede the catalogue, and the cataloguing itself is done with um, images, life-size, of every sheet. Um, the album sheets are numbered up to 23, but we only have 22 known sheets in our hands. Um, so one is missing, we know at least, and maybe there were more after 23. Um, so here is um, Ed Payne's uh, very elegant presentation and very beautifully written uh, account of what we think is going on in page one of album D. Um, contrasting it, because this is what we wanted to do all the way through, contrasting it um, with uh, not the print but another Sueño drawing for one of the Capriccio's prints. Um, with figures flying, um, hurtling up and hurtling down. Um, so that, that gives you an idea of the way that we approached um, the work on this um, particular project that we had. We didn't have very much time, um, and we had effectively 22 drawings to examine in detail. We saw every single sheet. They were examined um, intensely. Uh, we had we have a wonderful paper conservator at the Courtauld who came with us um, and led the investigation, in effect. We looked at the drawings in the Louvre, in the Metropolitan, in the Morgan. We went up to Boston. Um, everybody collaborated in the most astonishing way <coughs> to allow us to use their equipment. We worked with huge magnification. Uh, we worked with transmitted light. We tried as far as possible to see the backs of the drawings. And the work that Kate did um, with all of us, I mean, we, were, we really were a team working together. Um, she has produced a sort of complete catalogue um, of all 22 sheets, each one with a little thumbnail drawing beside it, which lists the technique, the paper, the watermark, um, any distinctive characteristics, inscriptions, um, the scraping techniques that Goya used on many of the sheets. And so we were able to zoom in. For example, um, this is a sheet that was discovered um, just before or while I was working on that exhibition in 2001 for the Hayward Gallery. It was completely unknown. And it had turned up in the museum in Marseille in the course of making an inventory. Um, of all the collections in the city. And this drawing appeared out of nowhere, nothing to say where it came from or what it was. Um, the person who found it was a drawings curator, and she had a fairly good idea of what it could be. Uh, sent it up, a photograph up to Paris. Uh, Paris sent it on to me, and I said, yes, it's album D, page 19, uh, with Mr. Madratho's collection number in the corner. Um, absolutely indisputable. That was without even seeing the paper or anything. And it's a wonderful drawing. It's quite unusual because it has a very big, uh, complicated background. Um, and in fact, it's been massively reworked. I think you can just see here a little bowl, like the one that held the magical potion for anointing the witch in the Courtauld drawing. It was probably very different in its first stage. And when we look at it with great magnification, you can see areas that have been scraped and redrawn. 
um, and here too, there are things that appear in the background which are undoubtedly transformations of Goya's original sketching on the, on the sheet. Um, what he did is he laid in a design with incredibly dilute um, strokes uh, that you glimpse here and there in all the drawings and then either strengthened them, left them if they were fine, um, removed them if he wanted to replace them, um, and worked very impulsively but very determinedly um, on these beautiful sheets of handmade paper which could actually survive um, the attack with um, scraper and, and razor and whatever it was that he used to make these um, great transformations. And he would lay down washes, and I think this gives you an extraordinary idea of the precision with which he worked, and the ex and and the freedom. I mean, with just the simplest washes and delicate touches of line, and then overlaying it with these incredibly exciting touches of very black, almost dry paint. Sometimes um, it's all carbon black ink applied with a brush. Um, and he gets incredible sense of vigor um, and wonderful patternings into these um, sheets. The work consisted, not all of the sheets are lucky enough to have full size, full numbering. Um, there are several sheets which don't have numbers. They've been erased or the sheet has been cropped and the numbers have been cut off. I mean, obviously, when, a, when an album is disbound and you're, you've only got one sheet or two, two at the most. Uh, numbers are irrelevant. Um, it's very, very lucky that a lot of them have survived, um, but some people did their best to get rid of them as not very sightly and not very meaningful. So one of the ways um, with the uh, drawings that, were n that had no numbers and um, were had been cropped or, or scrubbed was Kate was looking f for traces on the backs of the sheets um, sometimes you get offsetting, um, which when Goya closed his album, because this is what proved to us that they were done in a, in a bound volume, he would do a drawing, he would go off for lunch, close it, uh, before the ink had fully dried, and so some of the drawing that he'd been just doing would offset a little bit onto the back of the page in front. And Kate was even tracing things like a rust spot in the paper. This is the back of this drawing in the Metropolitan. And the rust spot, which is here, of course, um, enlarged, offset onto the front of the page behind it. Um, so th there are all kinds of ways of checking up on the order of the pages um, when you've lost the actual numbers on top. And uh, this is something that comes out in the final order that was um, arrived at, most of it fortunately um, through the numbers on the sheets, but in a good many cases uh, just by evidence um, of one sheet um, being in front of another and marking, even things like lumps in the handmade paper which had impressed onto the back of the sheet in front of it. Um, were enabled one to get close to it. And this is a fragment of um, a famous sheet showing this figure of Mother Celestina, um, tempting, as uh, Riva told us um, yesterday in the, in the rooms, uh, tempting passers-by um, or uh, holding out, in this case, possibly um, items that were going to lead to her death um, um, by, by, by murder and with her bottle in her hand and then a potions for her magical uh, sed seductive, um, seductive potions or whatever it was that she um, used as, as a procuress and a board. Um, so th this is the depth into which we went um, to produce evidence of the order and the fact that the drawings were made in a, clearly in a bound volume. Uh, what happened after Goya's death, having completed all his eight albums, um, which he probably took with him, we think he took them with him to Bordeaux and continued um, to make use of them, um, looking at them for inspiration, um, even when making the drawings that he continued to do in the Bordeaux albums. 
But after his death, um, his son, of course, inherited the whole lot. And there is testimony from uh, contemporary visitors to Javier Goya's home that he had put the drawings, uh, he'd obviously dismantled the albums, or disassembled them is, is the more correct term, and he had put them into three great tomes. And we don't know how this was done. They don't seem to have been pasted previously. Um, there, there's no um, indication, and it may have been that he did um, use the practice that people had used throughout um, the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries uh, for old master drawings, for example, which was simply to interleave them um, into blank albums of paper, blank volumes. But after Javier's death, um, when everything was inherited by that marvelous little boy upstairs, who was the apple of his grandfather's eye, things began to turn really bad. Um, and Mariano, um, I think even Javier had debts, and Mariano certainly had debts. And basically, he sold everything. Um, he sold the copper plates um, to one person or another, which is why they didn't all go to the Academy of San Fernando in one go. A good many of them were privately owned by different people, went to Paris, were printed in Paris, then brought back to Madrid, for example. Um, and the album drawings, um, there was uh, some sort of deal that was made about which we hope to find out a lot more. Um, but they basically went to two people. They went to Van Valentin Cadereira, who was an antiquarian, art historian, a great admirer of Goya. He'd actually wanted to be Goya's pupil. And Goya said, no, no, he wasn't taking students. Um, uh, when Goya, this was, a, I think it was around 1814-15, um, after the end of the war, and Valentin was just a very young artist. <laughs> but no, Goya wasn't having any of that. He kept his studio assistants, but he didn't want um, real pupils. Um, but Valentin Cadereira was fascinated by Goya's work, always kept a kind of an eye on it, and the opportunity came when Mariano wanted to sell up um, to take over um, the drawings in which he was particularly interested. And he got together with Federico de Madrazo, who was director of the Prado, first court painter at that time, um, and also an aficionado. And between them, also with Federico de Madrazo's brother-in-law, perhaps as a cover for a man who, after all, as director of the Prado, should only have been acquiring things that might go to the Prado. Um, but they sold, um, between them, a great block of drawings um, to the state, which allotted one group uh, to the what was called the Museo Nacional, the National Museum, which is known as La Trinidad. And in fact, that museum's um, possessions were absorbed back into the Prado uh, a little later. So the drawings that went to the Museo de la Trinidad ended up in the Prado, which has a magnificent collection. And another batch uh, was sold to the state and were allotted to the Bibliothèque Nacionale in Madrid. And they also <laughs> got um, a good many drawings which came uh, from Cardarera this time. The other lot had come from uh, Madrazo's brother-in-law to the Trinidad Museum. So a great number of drawings were sold off. And it may have been that this was to, in a way, defray the expenses of the drawings that they kept for themselves. And Madrazo kept a huge number. And what he did, um, having given away a few uh, just blank pages, um, I mean, unmounted drawings, uh, one went to the British Museum very early on in 1862, and it has the museum stamp on the back of the sheet, on the back of the drawing. So we know that it wasn't mounted. Um, and this was the case with several other drawings, which Madrazo gave to friends um, who put inscriptions on the back uh, to say when they had received the gift. Um, but the rest of them were mounted on pink paper, as were those that were sold off. Um, and this is uh, the only really surviving uh, testimony as to what happened. Madrazo took all the drawings, put them into three groups, 
numbered them in a particular way, each group, so that he could distinguish them, then had them mounted onto sheets of pink paper, and at least one lot were bound, and they were bound into a volume which, by a miracle, remained intact with all its drawings inside it until 1935. Um, Madrasso left the volume, gave the volume just before his death to his grandson. Grandsons have a good time. Um, and uh, th the grandson in question was Mariano Fortuni, um, who was an artist and a great dress designer, very fashionable man about town, had houses in Venice and in Paris. And he inherited this volume, which then had um, in, in effect, it had 50 drawings by Goya inside it, and I've done a mock-up here. This was the drawing that was mounted on page one, in other words, on the front of this, which is the back of page one, and then it was followed by drawings that were double-sided, this is one of the sheets, not from this particular volume, as I'll tell you, but this was a double-sided sheet from album B, um, which was inserted. All the album B sheets were inserted into these windows, which just cu slightly covered part of the drawing, as you can see here, because this um, drawing has a remnant of the album page around it, the pink paper page, uh, which, as you can see, even covered part of the inscription and has been torn away uh, to reveal the full inscription here. So that was placed um, face down, as it were, pasted onto one of these cutouts. Um, so this is a second grouping of the album pages. We think that Javier Goya, in his tomes, which nobody saw but which were commented on, um, probably kept them in order. Madratho, no. Madratho, what he did was a very kind of mid-19th century um, thing. He made them into amusing volumes of a sort of scrapbook, if you like. And he mixed up the albums. He mixed up the order of the sheets. He would even, um, although Goya's numbers are very clear, um, this is 91, and the verso of that is 92, um, he made this very funny verso page um, into the recto for his album, uh, which is why the pink paper covers the edges um, of the sheet that, he, that became the verso for his album uh, compilation. Uh, so 50 drawings were in this album. 50 drawings were in another of the groups, which we have assumed until now um, were also put into albums, bound albums. And the other two that, Malgum, uh, that Madrasso formed, uh, he sent to auction. He sent them to auction in Paris at the Hotel Drouot in 1877, and they were dispersed and sold singly. Whereas this one album that he gave to his grandson remained intact. So all the album drawings that you find in museums and private collections um, everywhere else, uh, they all came from that one auction sale, which included 105 drawings by Goya. Um, and they included examples from every single album, except the first one, the little album A, and none of the Bordeaux album drawings, but the others, yes, they were all interspersed, intermingled, and, and used to build up um, amusing collections that were undoubtedly shown to friends and passed round of an evening. Um, in the course of making this exhibition, oh yes, what I can show you here, this is a very old photograph. We've been working with um, the descendants of a collector who had more Goya drawings, which he acquired in that 1877 sale, than anybody else. And when he died, probably, um, for sort of inheritance and purposes and, and cataloging and so on, um, the drawings that he had acquired, not all directly, some of them he bought at sales of other collectors who had acquired at the 1877 sale, and then their collections were sold, and they went to the Calando family, this, this great Calando collector. Um, so when he died, um, photographs were taken of the apartment, 
absolutely plastered with the drawings, um, mounted on the boards um, on which they were sold at the Hotel Drouot. I mean, they hadn't been touched. Um, so here you have uh, this drawing, which is this, which actually became a, a frontispiece for one of the groups. Um, it has Madrasso's number one up in the corner here, although for Goya it's the verso number 92 of album B. So you can see how complicated this thing gets to work out. Um, here is the Courtauld drawing. Um, this is taken from the catalogue, um, and we've put little marks around them to make them easier to identify. Uh, but here's album D3, um, plastered up on the wall here. Um, and here's the Celestina, uh, which is also from album D, which we've just seen a detail of um, in the previous. So it's full of things um, that are very interesting. And of course, uh, the verso of this, which is not shown in this photograph, um, is this drawing here, the recto <coughs> and the verso. Um, and the uh, beautiful drawing um, of Goya's self-portrait was not obviously, presumably, from an album. It's, a, it's just a self-portrait. And that um, Madrasso got and used as the frontispiece to his volume, which he obviously regarded as the best and the one that he wanted to keep for himself. With um, these albums, uh, with the album drawings and the different albums made by Goya, we are never entirely sure whether the number that we get to the end of a series uh, with is really the last one. And w we had the most, in the, in the process of, of, of working on this exhibition, we made the most extraordinary discovery um, for a quite unrelated reason. Um, I was um, asking about another drawing from album E, which seemed to be related. This was a question of actually of, the, of one of the Nazi um, restitution drawings, which had been claimed um, by people who said that it had been stolen from them. So the Louvre had to go back into the whole restitution question. And there was a drawing from album E, which had a stamp on it, uh, which related it to the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Orléans. And so the Louvre went back to them and said, please, please, please check that this wasn't in your museum because it's a stolen drawing. And they wrote back um, saying, this is all happened by email, saying, no, we've been through all our inventories, absolutely everyone. This drawing was never part of our collection. And they added, we do have two other going, drawings by Goya, but not the one that you're after. So I was sent a, photo a copy of this email, and I thought to myself, what? Goya drawings in Orléans? Never heard of this. And sent an email immediately saying, please, please send a photograph um, of the two. Well, one of them was a ridiculous attribution, nothing to do with Goya at all. It was more like Ribera. But the other one was this, um, a large sheet of pink paper with a recto verso drawing, uh, this is a more a detail of the verso one, um, and laid on this large sheet, like the albums here, uh, it had Madrasso's number on uh, both sides. It was in the 1877 sale. It didn't sell at the sale. And it was given a few months later by a local collector and printmaker to the museum, where it has been ever since, completely, completely unknown. So that was extraordinarily exciting. But even from the really bad drawing, bad photograph that was sent, I could see that there was something not right with the drawings. Um, the extraordinary thing was that they have numbers which follow on uh, from the last numbers in Goya's album B. And the numbers on the page looked exactly like his other numbers. So, and I quickly found out that the paper was identical um, with album B paper. So it looked like a page from album B, uh, which had been numbered by Goya, but not used by him, used by somebody else. Um, as you can see, these drawings at the end of album B, they have lots of captions up the top, down the bottom. They're satirical, they're caricatures. These have no captions whatsoever, 
And when you look closely, and I don't, I'm not going to show you a close-up of this, but I think you can get a sense of it from here, they're not very good. They're floppy. Um, they're simply, uh, they're simple drawings. And they look back, in fact, to the earlier drawings um, in album B before Goya started making the caricature series. So the notion came up, who could have done them? Undoubtedly, somebody in Goya's studio, and we know he had assistants, we know he had particular assistants whom he helped, trained, um, who were working alongside him. And one assumes that these, therefore, uh, could be uh, drawings that were made for that purpose, to help a young assistant uh, master the art of drawing, as he would ha have helped him to master the art of painting. And the interesting thing for us, uh, which we'd had at the back of our minds all the way through this examination of album D, was that album D is also on the identical paper to album B. And because we were able to prove that album D was also a bound volume, the thought came that they may very well have been one single volume and that Goya used blank pages that he'd given up uh, making further drawings in for himself um, and let a student use them, and that there were further blank pages which he took up later on, a good many years later on, um, and produced album D. And what is so interesting is that many of the drawings at, in, in, the, in the album B series include wi witchcraft scenes. And this is the subject that he then takes up uh, when he moves on uh, to create his album B, which he must have done, we think, um, around 1819. Uh, the drawings in album D, the witches and old women drawing, are actually very close to his first attempts in lithography. And that's one of the f rare secure dates that we have. We know that a lithographic printing shop was set up in Madrid only in 1819. Spain, as usual, was rather behind the rest of Europe, which had been using uh, lithography from the end of the 18th century. Um, but in 1819, it was brought back to Spain by somebody who'd been sent off to Paris to learn the trade um, and, the tricks and the tricks of the trade of lithography. Um, and um, he wasn't very skilled. He didn't do very good lithographs himself. And, but Goya rushed in um, the moment the, the shop was set up um, and, and tried his hand at it. And we are, I'm not going to show them to you here, but we're having in the exhibition uh, a selection of these very, very rare, very early lithographs, um, some of them in, in unique impressions, um, which seem to very, very much um, go together with these uh, witches and old, wi old women uh, drawings, which most of them, unlike this one here, which starts the album, um, most of them are single figures on a very plain white background. And so here you have the results, in a sense, of, of the um, huge amount of research that went into this project um, with the first drawing, which miraculously reappeared. It was completely unknown until a few years ago. And it reappeared, believe it or not, on the original sheet on which it was sold in 1877. Those are the sheets uh, that you see on the wall um, in, the, in, in the apartment of Mr. Calando. Um, and uh, so it was a, a sort of extraordinary um, uh, coming together, if you like, of the whole of the provenance um, of these dispersed and scattered drawings. And here was one which had escaped everybody's attention. It was in the 1877 sale, and it had just completely gone off the map and reappeared. So there you have the catalogue, the work that went into it, and I hope you'll all come and see it. Thank you very much.
Um, our last speaker this morning is Dr. Janice, Janice Tomlinson. Uh, she's the Director of University Museums at the University of Delaware, a position she has held since 2003. She has published prolifically on Goya, including such seminal books as Graphic Evolutions, the print series of Francisco Goya, and Goya in the Twilight of the Enlightenment. She has participated also in numerous exhibitions on Goya, including the recent exhibition on the disasters of war held at Pomona College Museum of Art and the University Museums at the University of Delaware. Uh, today, she will speak to us about Goya in Perspective, exhibitions 1974 to 2008. Thank you. Um, the title of my talk, Goya in Perspective, refers to a collection of essays published by Fred Licht in 1967, which offers an approximate chronological point of departure for my paper. For this volume, Licht selected readings to introduce Goya to an undergraduate audience. Um, and these included essays by European scholars who wrote either about well-known works, Lopez Rea and Los Caprichos, La Fuente Ferrari, uh, on the 2nd and 3rd of May, or presented the artist within a very broad European context. Given the nature of this book, Fred Licht did not choose to include more uh, in-depth analyses and, uh, than of Goya's works, particularly uh, his prints and drawings, such as the article by Eleanor Sayre on the uh, early definition of the album drawings that had appeared in the Burlington Magazine in 1964, an edition of the Burlington Magazine undoubtedly inspired by the Royal Academy exhibition of 1963. <laughs> Now, our, our knowledge of Goya has grown immensely since that time, due in large part to exhibitions the world over. It would be impossible for me to do them all justice. So what follows is a very personal and inevitably very selective perspective. The exhibition I found most exciting, the exhibitions that I found most exciting over the years are those that truly embrace and explore the artist's complexity. I was extremely fortunate that my first experience to a curated exhibition of Goya's work was during a vacation home from college uh, when I went into Boston to see the changing exhibitions, uh, the changing image, Prints by Francisco Goya, curated by Eleanor Sayre. The installation invited close looking, comparison of preliminary drawings, working proofs, published editions uh, for all of Goya's print series. And of course, I had no idea, as I studied the comparisons presented, how rare this opportunity would prove to be. I will never forget the excitement as an undergraduate of discovering Goya as a draftsperson, as a printmaker, and of gaining insight into the art of printmaking, and of being introduced to the historical context for his prints. It would all come back to me three years later. I had gone to graduate school with the intention of writing a dissertation on Catalan Romanesque mural painting. However, having completed my master's thesis on the cult of the Holy Cross in Western architecture from 450 to 750 AD, I asked, nay, I went running to John McCubry, the specialist in late 18th century and 19th century art, whose iconographic approach would inform my own early work on Goya. I asked if I might undertake an independent study, Goya's Toromachia, on exhibition upstairs. This would lead to a dissertation proposal on a series of five paintings known to you, many of you, in the Royal Academy of San Fernando in Madrid, a topic I revised as I explored their sources, which led me to Goya's tapestry cartoons. Now, in preparing this presentation, I decided to forego a chronological survey of exhibitions and to cut to the chase by introducing three that represent for me the ne plus ultra of Goya exhibitions. Eleanor Serre's The Changing Image, Prince by Francisco Goya, is certainly one of them. After that 1974 exhibition, almost two decades would pass before I felt a similar excitement of discovery in viewing, only in its London and Chicago venues, Truth and Fantasy, Goya, The Small Paintings, curated by Juliet Wilson Burrow, and Manuela Bimena Marques. Truth and Fantasy offered many things, including an introduction to the recently discovered Italian sketchbook, uh, represented on the left, as well as a survey of Goya's career through small format paintings, from early sketches to religious paintings 
to genre scenes such as that on the right, and to the wonderful late miniatures, 12 of which were included. The masterfully honed selection left no doubt about attributions. And this, as we'll see, was a timely response to exhibitions of the previous decade that had included works uh, of dubious origin. Equally important, the works in Truth and Fantasy illustrated how inventive and resourceful, how daring, technically superb, a painter was, a Goya was. The catalog remains seminal in the Goya literature. Now, my Goya frison would not return until I saw the 2008 exhibition at the Museo de Prado, Goya en tiempos de guerra, Goya uh, during the times of war, which marks the chronological limit of my paper. Disclosure, I contributed an essay on Goya and Jericho to that catalog. Of course, the Prado is unique in its ability to do a great Goya exhibition by drawing from its own collection, including works such as the recently conserved 2nd and 3rd of May, 1808, the 2nd of May now on the screen, for which a revised history was put forth in the exhibition catalog. We now know that it was an official commission and once hung in the royal palace. The exhibition extended, however, far beyond the 1808 to 1814 dates we usually identify as the war years, opening with small paintings assigned in the Truth and Fantasy exhibition to 1793-94 and ending in 1820. It reminded us that repercussions of the Napoleonic devastation of Spain, like the impact of any war, resonated far beyond the date when peace treaties were signed. We may well ask if Goya would have imagined the emblems of a world of nonsense that he called the disparates, had he not witnessed the violence of the war, the destruction, as well as the dissolution of the old regime that for five decades had been his world. That exhibition, in presenting the full range of Goya's works, undid also all romantic myths of Goya during the war, the aging, isolated artists working tirelessly on the print series of the disasters. It showed an artist who, when commissions faltered, honed his skills in a series of very intimate and beautiful still lives, one of which is on view upstairs. And also, the same artist who found respite from the violence of the area in portraits of his ever dapper grandson, Mariano, all of so in view 15 years later, upstairs, and of the Marquesa de, Mon de Monte Hermosa, daughter of Spanish supporters of Joseph Bonaparte on the right. Exhibited alongside the disasters of war were these pendants, whose subject is identified in an inscription as the production of gunpowder in the Sierra de Tardienta. Compared with Goya's earlier small genre paintings, these canvases show a new specificity of narrative and gesture that I think might be attributed to the lessons he learned as he developed the disasters of war. The exhibition catalog, unfortunately not published in English, remains uh, seminal. Now what do the exhibitions on my admittedly very opinionated and very short list have in common? Well, long after they've closed, they remain relevant. Their catalogs reflect the curator's expertise, many years of thoughtful looking and original research. But equally important was that Goya's work defined the exhibition and not the other way around. The curators recognized a need to study and present a particular body of work, and that study was the, an end in itself. There was no defined theme to be served by a specific selection of works, an approach that, as a friend of mine commented in a recent conversation, always run the, runs the risk of turning ex exhibited masterpieces into illustrations. In these exhibitions, the works were the story. Now, I'd like to return to the chronological point of departure for my exhibition in the 1960s. By the 1974 date of the Changing Ime exhibition, as we've seen, the Goya stage was set. Tomas Harris's catalog of engravings and lithographs had appeared in 1963. The Harris collection would enter the British Museum in 1979, and Juliet wilson Barrow would publish a publication, uh, uh, have an introductory publication to it in 1981. 1970 also thought the publication of the Catalog Raisonné by Pierre Gassier and Juliet Wilson, and Gassier's uh, catalogs of Goya's drawings would soon follow. 
It's not surprising then that during the 1980s there followed a number of small monographic exhibitions in Europe and the United States. While a 1982 exhibition of paintings in Swiss collections sought to expand the catalog, the Prado exhibition of Goya paintings from Madrid collections the following year introduced a number of significant works to the Prado, including the Contes of Chinchon that would enter the Prado in the year 2000, and the shipwreck still in a private collection. Goya Joven was born with an exhibition of 1986. Now, each of these exhibitions included works no longer attributed to Goya, or today at least questioned, and thus served as the foil again for the critical contribution of Goya, truth and fantasy of the following decade. But also during the 1980s, there were a series of exhibitions that attempted to present a broader context for Goya's work. In 1980, European art at the Spanish court during the 18th century, co-curated curated by Alfonso Pérez Sánchez, Gilbert Martin Marie in Bordeaux and Jeanine Baticle was presented in Madrid, Bordeaux, and Paris, providing a sweeping overview of art, not just artists of the 18th century Bourbon court. The catalog for this in innovative exhibition points out the challenge, however, to art history to really come to grips with, the cos uh, with a truly cosmopolitan court like that of 18th century Spain. Rather than explore the interchange and interrelation among the artists of diverse origins who worked at court or that arrived to court, the catalog was divided into three sections, Spanish painters, French painters, Italian painters. Within each, artists were lifted, listed alphabetically. With painters thus quarantined within their national schools and arranged alphabetically, it was left to the reader to reconstruct who coincided with whom in painting for the court and also to suggest how they might have influenced one another. For example, that exhibition made me aware of this painting by Claude-Joseph Vernet, um, a favorite artist of Goya's pa patron, the Prince of Asturias and later Charles IV. Painted for Isabel Farnese, Charles IV's grandmother, and in the Spanish royal collection uh, prior to be, uh, being removed by Joseph Bonaparte, which is how it found its way to Philadelphia, it shows a Farnese palace owned by Charles IV's father, Charles III, uh, at, well, when he, as king of Naples. Now, Goya, in his well-known conception of the meadow of St. Isidore, uh, I think emulates and updates Goya's fashionable gathering before a distant royal palace. And although we are accustomed to seeing Goya's meadow as a small painting, usually described as impressionistic, let us not forget that it was painted as a sketch for a tapestry cartoon never realized. That cartoon and the tapestry after it would have measured 20 feet in length, thus allowing Goya to trump his patron's favorite view painter, whose Cardinal Aquaviva measures only 10 feet. Other exhibitions of the 1980s included Goya at the Art and the Art of His Time at the Meadows Museum, which considered Spanish painters at court during and immediately after Goya's time, and also included works by Tieplo and, and after Mengs. The order of the works clearly gave priority to Goya, relegating his contemporaries to the background. Another exhibition, which we're not illustrating, was in 1989, painting in Spain during the later 18th century at the National Gallery in London, followed the gallery's acquisitions of works by Francisco Bayeo, Luis Melendez, and Luis Paretti Alcázar. No works by Goya were on view. And that same year, of course, coincides with the well-known exhibition of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the Met, and the Prado, Goya in the Spirit of Enlightenment. These two ideas of the contextual exhibition and the theme of enlightenment informed a little a, a 1995 exhibition, Painting in Spain in the Age of Enlightenment, curated by Rhonda Castle and Suzanne Stratton. Although originally planned for two venues, the Indianapolis Museum of Art and the Spanish Institute in New York City, the exhibition was in the end seen only in Indianapolis, which was a great shame. Both exhibition and catalog were ordered chronologically from discussion of French artists active in Madrid during the reign of the first Bourbon king, Philip V, to major commissions at the court up to the, uh, into the reign of Ferdinand VII in the early 19th century. The two works shown here illustrated the final section, which uh, Rhonda titled, There Are No Rules in Painting, a quotation from Goya's 1792 report to the Royal Academy which invited us to consider the invention of the yard with lunatics, uh, 
from the Meadows Museum, within mm -hmm. a broader context of well-known artists such as Melendez and Paret and Maedia, as well as lesser-known figures such as Antonio Carnicero and Jose Camarón, whose invention is seen in the painting on the right. I imagine that this exhibition might have had wider resonance had it traveled to New York and might have inspired others to continue or at least acknowledge its line of inquiry. Unfortunately, this did not happen. The following year, our exhibition of uh, the context for Goya as a printmaker was greatly enhanced by the exhibition Idioma Universal Goya in la Biblioteca Nacional, uh, Universal Language Goya in the National Library, curated again by Juliet wilson Barrault and Elena Santiago at the National Library in Madrid. As a visitor to the, to the exhibition, I found it overwhelming, and every time I return to the catalog, I understand why. Far from just presenting Goya as a printmaker, it provided a framework of print culture in late 18th and early 19th century Madrid, with an important introduction to the print collection of Goya's patron and friend, Theon Bermudez, represented by the two works on the screen. That exhibition also included contemporary prints and myriad uh, books and myriad works from, uh, that recorded the contemporary events of the day and it also included the emblem of the Pestalozzi Institute, which I chose for this lecture because this is a print after the emblem for the Pestalozzi Institute painted by Goya, the painting now lost, uh, which I show with Goya, a copy after Goya's painting of Manuel Godoy as a patron of the Pestalozzi Institute because, of course, here in the museum you have a fragment for the lost painting of Manuel Godoy as a patron of the Pestalozzi Institute. The Biblioteca Nacional was one of many commemorating the 250th anniversary of the artist's birth. And of special interest to me, there was an exhibition of tapestry, tapestries and cartoons in the Patrimonio Nacional on view at the Royal Palace. Although the exhibition was a wide-ranging presentation of selected cartoons and tapestries, documents related to Goy's career, documents related to the tapestry factory, the catalog remains of interest for its refinement of earlier reconstructions of installations of the tapestries by the Prado, uh, at the Pardo Palace by Jose Luis Sancho. Now, looking beyond Madrid, the list of exhibitions from 1996 to 2006 would include those in New York, Philadelphia, Stockholm, Lille, Copenhagen, London, Washington, Mexico City, and I'm sure there are many others. Many were overviews, but some examined particular aspects of Goya's works and deserve a longer discussion than I can offer here, and these include drawings from um, private albums at, at the Hayward, curated by Juliet, Goya images of women at the National Gallery in the Prado, and Goya's late works. As an overview exhibition, Goya, Prophet of the Modern, seen in Ver Vienna and Berlin, certainly stands out. In that same year, uh, the Italian context for Goya was explored in a small exhibition in Parma, a theme to be expanded in a 2008 exhibition in Saragossa. My colleagues have spoken eloquently of the immediate past and future of Goya exhibitions. Beyond looking forward to album D and Goya's portraiture, we can anticipate exhibitions in 2016 and 2019 to be coordinated with the projected publication of a five-volume catalog resume of Goya's uh, uh, drawings. But where do we go from here? There will always be overview exhibitions, and given Goya's track work record, they will be successful. But what other approaches might broaden our understanding of the artist? Well, of course, many of us would love to have an exhibition of works the attribution of which has been questioned, but not entirely rejected or universally rejected, with, with full technical documentation, discussions, and possibly even a publication that followed rather than preceded the exhibition. But whether museums would lend to such an exhibition or whether scholars could reach a consensus, well, those are pretty important questions. Another option might be Goya, Goyesque in the 19th century that might include words, works such as those shown here, the bullfight in the divided ring in the upper left from the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the so-called procession in Valencia from the Boer Foundation. Now, examination of the Goyesque a style of imitation possibly based as much on the written descriptions of Gautier than, uh, as on the works of Goya, would not only illustrate how many of, of the misperceptions about the artists that still linger were born, 
but also would invite a discussion of issues of na national identity through art and the idea of the national school that informed the evolving image of Goya. Or a collection would consider the history of its own treasures. For example, the drawings once bound in the album um, by Federico, uh, once bound by Federico 